Okay. So welcome everyone. My name is Tim Wee. Um, if for people are wondering about my last name is spelled O-E-Y, but it's pronounced like W-E-E. -E. It's an Indonesian Chinese name with a Dutch spelling. Um, I grew up near Montreal, uh, but in the New York state side of the border. And I bicycled everywhere as a kid. And then I, um, as I didn't, I, I biked actually in uh, Boston a lot. I was a VP of rides there for the Charles River Wheelers. It's the largest bike club in that area. Um, I didn't own a car, um, even though I had through school and through work early in my career. Uh, I did get a car when I moved to California. I shouldn't have gotten a car. I should have stayed biking everywhere. Um, I've biked across the country twice on business trips, once during college for Oxfam America, raising money, second time uh, talking about, and the second time in 2019, talking about uh, zero waste and how bicycling is great for the world. Actually, I was talking about oceans, plastic, climate change, and kids, um, because we need to save our world in a multiple different ways so that it's a beautiful place for our kids. And bicycling is one of the best ways to do that. So thank you for joining me tonight. And again, yeah, if you're able to, I mean, I, um, so several of you have shown your video, which is awesome because as a presenter, it, it's really daunting to present to an empty room. It's much more engaging to see people's faces. Um, so thank you for um, sharing your video if you've done that. Okay, and I'm also a league cycling instructor. That's what the LCI is after my name for league cycling instructor. Um, so this particular class, um, Smart Cycling Part 1 and Part 2, is a prerequisite for becoming a league cycling instructor. Um, so it's three hours of classroom and then six hours of on-bike construction. And then the league cycling instructor um, course itself is a three-day a three course, um, 24 hours of ed, um, education. Um, that if you're in, interested in becoming an instructor, I would encourage you. We need we have uh, millions of people in this area that all need to know how to ride their bicycles better. Okay, um, so welcome. Here's a happy crowd of uh, Silicon Valley bicycle people. Uh, this was in Sunnyvale, a picture taken before a ride there. Um, bicycling is a joyful, wonderful activity to do, which has so many benefits because you get to build community, like you see these people here. You have to make a road safer because bicycles really don't kill very many people. Um, car, the real danger is cars and having people drive cars. If we reduce, we get rid of the cars, it's super safe for pedestrians and bicyclists. And then there's climate change, there's pollution, there's exercise, there's saving money. Uh, there are so many wins from bicycling. So thank you for joining us. And here's a little video I'm going to play just to uh, orient ourselves and remind that we're all human. Let me uh, get this started. Bicyclists are people just like you. Like you, bicyclists have friends and family that care about them. Like you, people on bikes expect and deserve to arrive at their destination safely, every time. Although people on bikes may look a little different or may not always ride in a way that you believe they should, bicyclists are people. I ride my bike because it keeps me connected to my community. I ride my bike because it creates sunshine in my mind. I ride my bike to deliver food. I ride my bike because it's easy to get places on it and it's saving the planet. More and more people are choosing to run errands and go places by bike. Some people ride for fun and some people ride for function. It is important for you as a driver to safely share the road with all people on bikes. Remember to slow down and pass with caution. Drivers can avoid most crashes by simply slowing down. Remember, speed limits are maximums, not minimums. When passing, allow at least five feet of space between your car and the bike. This will ensure enough room for the person on a bike to keep traveling safely while you pass. Thanks for sharing the road. This particular video is taken from our um, uh, driver class for people driving around bicycles, but most of you are likely drivers. So this is a reminder of you as a driver, um, pay attention to the bicyclists and the pedestrians around you. Okay, so Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. I hope all of you who are not yet members will join the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. You can go to bikesiliconvalley.org to visit our website. We're a nonprofit member-based organization whose mission is to build healthier and more just communities by making bicycling safe and accessible for everyone. Bicycling is a great equalizer that puts everyone on a common ground. We can meet each other and say hi to each other and enjoy um, our world. Um, the Bike Coalition focuses on two areas. We focus on people, all of you, uh, coming to our classes, becoming better educated, so you're better cyclists as well as better drivers. We have rides. We have other events like Bike to Wherever Day, Bike to Work Day. 
Um, and we have a lot of advocates out there that we try to get people trained to uh, speak out for bicycles in their community. Uh, there's these things called local teams that are organized in many different communities that help work with cities in our area to make biking better in those areas. And that's the brings the other uh, spot up, places. We focus also on making sure that we have safe facilities for all of our bicyclists. Uh, bike lanes, roads, trails, bike parking, um, all of those are needed for bicyclists to have a good experience. Um, unlike cars, bicyclists don't carry around multi-ton security cages wrapped around their vehicles. Um, their vehicles are, are exposed, so we really want more bike lockers or safe places to put bikes so pieces of the bike don't disappear. So I encourage you strongly to become a member of the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition, um, uh, volunteer with us, make donations, um, go to more of our events, other uh, uh, education opportunities we have as well. It's a fun time. Um, we also uh, deliver um, uh, vegetables by bicycle in bike boxes uh, through Vegolution in uh, East San Jose and lots of fun programs to participate in. This training that you're taking is funded by 2016 Measure B, thanks to VTA, that's the Valley Transit Authority. Um, they're our transit agency and also our congestion management agency for Santa Clara County. Uh, they would like to see a lot more people biking as well as taking transit. Biking and transit go very well together because you can take your bike on the bus, on light rail, on Caltrain, on BART, and then you can, so you can get to your station by bike. You can take your bike with you, and then you can leave the station to go wherever you want to go with your bike. So it really extends the reach of transit in our area. And in our area, we're less dense. So the bicycle is a key enabler to make transit really work. So having bikes work with transit is awesome. Um, soon we'll actually be having a video coming out to help people learn about how to take their bike on a bus and on light rail. Um, uh, Cal, uh, sorry, um, BART, it's really easy to sort of roll it on, roll it off. Caltrain is not too much harder, but right now you have to go up some steps to get on there. Um, but the bus system and the light rail system have some extra challenges in how to use the rack. So we have a video coming out soon that covers that. By the way, during this presentation, if you have any questions or comments, you can pop them in the chat. You can also raise your hand. And I'll call on people you know, during the presentation so we can answer questions as we go. There'll also be different points during the presentation where um, I'll just ask for questions as well at the end. We'll have a brief um, break, like ha roughly halfway where you can get water or go to the bathroom, whatever, to get a little bit of a break and then we'll keep going. So maybe like a five minute break. Okay, so first off, I'm gonna put up a poll to find out who's here with me based on the type of bicycling you do. So I'm gonna launch this poll here and then you can answer it. So hopefully you have a poll up. Yep, I'm seeing some people starting to answer the poll and just check off as many of the options um, that apply to you. Okay, I've got 12 of 13 so far. Ah, there we got 100% participation. Okay, I'm going to end this poll and then share the results. So it looks like most of you are recreational cyclists, which is great because biking is an excellent way to have fun outside, see the world, enjoy nature and get exercise. Got a few bike commuters out there and have um, some people do also shopping and errands. And I've got April raising her hand. Yes, April, what's up? A quick comment. Um, it looks like you only had um, a, a single choice. So for those of us who oh. participate in multiple categories, it didn't give us that option. Just why? Sorry, I thought I switched it to multiple choice. My apologies. Okay, we got <laughs> <laughs> some of those up there. And thanks for putting in the chat. Also, I see some people actually put in the recreation commute shop errands. Yeah, I um I I do all of these recreation commute shop errands, bicycle touring, mountain biking, um, and other. Um, I used to race long, long, long time ago, uh, just out of college. I also, um, I help people move stuff, lots of stuff. I can actually move more of my bike than can fit in any of your cars, unless you have a U-Haul cargo van that you drive around as your main car. Um, and we'll see that later. Okay. Um, onward. So this training that you're taking uh, was created by the League of American Bicyclists. Uh, you can go to bikelead.org uh, to visit their website. They're the national version of us. So the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition is for Santa Mateo County, and Santa Clara County. League of American Bicyclists covers um, the whole entire United States. 
and they advocate for bicyclists. And they've been around since 1880. They've been around a long time. And they were super popular early on before cars happened because everyone, bicycles were invented, they popped out and they were really popular and everyone was joining the bike league. Um, so they focus on creating safer roads and stronger communities and a bicycle friendly America for everyone. They've got bicycle friendly ratings for all the cities in our area. So you can see how, um, you know, they're, they're scored so the cities can compete with each other to see how good a job they're doing. And they provide a lot of information for bike advocates and other bikes and bicycles in general. Um, and they work to celebrate and preserve the freedom cycling brings to everyone everywhere. Um, they run the smart cycling program, which this is a smart cycling class you're taking. They have bicycle friendly America for um, cities, for businesses and for universities. They rank, they rate them all um, based on how well they serve bicyclists. They conduct a national bike summit every year. I've attended actually virtually uh, the past three years and I've had a good time learning a lot there. Um, they help support federal, state and local bike advocacy. So um, we're Silicon Valley Bike Coalition is this, basically a part of the larger national group. We also have CalBike, which is at the state level, and they're also part of a larger national group. Uh, typically, there's one um, state advocacy group per state in the United States. Um, there's also, they have the Active Transportation Leadership Institute, which the um, Bike League also runs. Okay, so getting to know each other, uh, either in, well, actually, just let's pop this in the chat. Um, what was your first bike? Who taught you to ride? And what did your first bike mean to you in one word? So just pop that into the chat. Yeah, I see a lot of people whose dads taught them how to ride or a mom and a dad. And yeah, for me as a kid, it was freedom. I didn't have to wait for my car, my parents to drive me someplace. I got to go where I wanted to go when I wanted to go. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for sharing in the chat where oh, they've got a mountain bike, Schwinn. Actually, my second bike was a Schwinn. My first one. I have no idea what brand it was. It was some random thing. But the second bike was a blue Schwinn Stingray. And I loved biking on that bike everywhere. Cool. Thank you very much for sharing in the chat. I'm going to continue onwards. So the Smart Cycling Manual see featured here. If you come to Smart Cycling Part 2, you're rewarded with one of these manuals that you can take home with you so you can continue to refer to it as a reference. Also, um, at Smart Cycling Part 2, you will have a test based on the material in this course you're taking right now, and which all the answers are also in the Smart Cycling Manual. Um, in the Part 2 course, you have, by the way, you get a bunch of other goodies. Um, you get uh, tire levers, a patch kit, and some other things. But the Smart Cycling Manual is very useful. Um, so yeah, we've got the classroom, which you're in now, where to cover some basics, intermediate, and advanced piece. And then we've got the on-bike piece. I strongly, strongly encourage you to sign up for the on bike piece because reading about it, listening about it, that's all passive. And you don't really, really learn it until you really do it. And at our class, we uh, typically have uh, four students for each instructor. So you've got really close attention. Um, the on bike piece, we will practice some safety maneuvers and the parking lots and some other just skills to, to um, handling skills in the parking lot to make sure we can all handle our bikes well. And we can also perform some emergency safety maneuvers, which a lot of you probably have never seen these safety maneuvers before, but they're, they're quite, can be quite challenging, but also quite fun. Um, and then we do a, the biggest part of the on-bike piece is we do road rides, where you'll ride a course once where the instructor will teach you about how to handle all the different things on this obstacle course of traffic that you're going through. And then each student gets to lead the group through that obstacle course and see if they can execute all the maneuvers correctly in the real world situation with real world traffic. And then, um, so that's your, uh, you get, then you then you get, you get tested on the road. Um, and uh, let's see, then you, if you pass both part one and part two, uh, the part one actually test is a paper test, which we give at the part two class. Um, or you can take the uh, test online. After this course is over, you'll get an email from me on how to take it online if you wish to take the online version. And then you show us either your online certificate or you have a passing score in the uh, paper test. 
And then we see if you have a passing score on the road test, and then you get a certificate at the part two class. Some other resources, there are a lot of online videos. The uh, Silicon Valley Bike Coalition, we have a bunch of videos and other courses on our um, uh, uh, bikesiliconvalley.org slash ED page, our education page. Uh, and the Bike League also will have that link coming up shortly. Actually, here it is, bikeleague.org slash RightSpark. Uh, they've got a bunch of videos also that are excellent training videos. Uh, the Bike League also has a quick guide, which is just a really short summary of the stuff that we're covering in the class tonight. And a lot of tips on their website, as well as our bikesiliconvalley.org website. So for the basics, we're going to talk about bicycles, the bicycle itself, bicycle maintenance, the clothing equipment, and then we'll talk some about handling skills. So let's get rolling. So choosing your bike, um, how much should you spend? Well, it's up to you about how much your budget is and what kind of riding you want to do. Um, uh, so it depends where you ride and what you want to use your bike for. Do you want to haul a lot of stuff? Do you want to bike across the country? Do you want to race? Do you want to do mountain biking? Lots of different kinds of bikes. So we've got road, mountain, hybrid comfort, recumbent, folding, tandem, electric bikes, and more. There are lots of different varieties of bikes. Um, here's a bunch of people enjoying uh, one of our fundraising rides we had a little while back. So the road bike is like the classic bike. It's got skinny tires. You've got gears. You can shift. Um, a lot of times you've got these um, curved handlebars. Um, that allow you to be on the top side um, is more comfortable, or you can go into what are called the drops. So you can be more streamlined in a narrow saddle. This is designed for speed on paved roads, typically. Although gravel bikes look very much like this also. So this is a classic road bike you're seeing here in this picture. Um, you've got fixies, which are road bike-like bikes, um, typically with flat handlebars across the bottom, but they have no gears. So they're very much like track bikes, because um, track bikes have no gears also. They ride in a track. And these are very popular because these are like the most basic bike. It's just a bike, nothing fancy about it. Um, those are fixies. Um, you've got mountain bikes, which now you're seeing the heavier tires, the thicker tires to really allow you to go off-road and go over bumps and through mud and grass and other stuff. I'm typically have flat bars across for this, just and really wide. They typically the um the handlebars are quite wide to give you more uh, leverage so you can turn. Um, and you've got really low gearing on mountain bikes. So you're going up and down mountains. Um, and you've got shock absorbers in the front. Uh, this one's actually got a hard tail. I don't see any shocks in the back, but they often have shocks in the back as well as the front um, to allow you to go over bumps more smoothly without hurting yourself. A hybrid bike is kind of a cross between a mountain bike and a, uh, a road bike, where it's more relaxed position like a mountain bike. It's got thicker tires. Usually have fenders on these because this is the kind of bike you just sort of bop about on a city. And this is like the kind of bike you'd want if you're just doing city errands, commuting, average kind of stuff, not doing super long distances. You want a very practical bike that keeps your clothing clean, has a rack in the back, you can put your backpack, put a baskets and that kind of thing. Um, a cruiser is a variation on the hybrid bike, which is really laid back. You sit very upright, got a big cushy seat, no gears because it's meant for very flat areas. Big, thick tires, usually, so they can go across sand or whatever. It's like a beach cruiser. Um, you've got some bikes that are step-through bikes. It used to be called women's bikes, but we don't call them women's bikes. A lot of people appreciate having this low step-through because some people can't get their leg very high, so they can't throw their bike, their leg over the back to get on. Having a step-through bike is a nice option. Very popular with uh, hybrid bikes and with city bikes, and with uh, so they can just get on and off more easily. Like if you want to wear a skirt or fancy clothing, this is easier. Got recumbent bikes, which some people don't like sitting upright on a hard, you know, a small seat. They like to have the big recliner kind of seat that they get to lounge in and pedal, um, where their feet are up in the front pedaling. Now, um, these bikes are really comfortable for some people. Um, some people love them. They're very, they tend to be very aerodynamic. This is actually a higher recumbent. They're also lower ones as well. Um, they is harder to climb hills though with these because when you're upright, you can actually put your weight on top of the pedal and push it down. Here it's just pure muscle power. You don't get the weight of your body behind it. Um, but this, these are very popular and uh, um, some speed records have been set on recumbents because they can be very streamlined. And you've got your folding bike. This is a Brompton. I have one of these. Um, this is a super practical bike also because if you don't have much space, you can fold it up into a tiny package, which you just grab the seat and carry it on and put it even in places that they don't allow bikes. So on a bus or a train where they don't normally allow bikes, 
you fold it up and then it's just, you know, a piece of luggage and you just pop it on a rack or under your seat. Also, uh, if you live in an apartment, you could just pop it under a bed or under a desk or in a corner if, at work. Um, you know, it's nice to bring your bike inside and just pop it under your desk rather than having to leave it locked up outside. It makes it more secure. This is a highly practical bike to, uh, to use. Um, and it takes um, this particular bike, you can uh, fold it and unfold it in like 10 to 15 seconds each direction. So it can be very quick to fold up and to unfold. And tandem bikes, uh, you know, bicycle built for two. Um, it's fun to have a partner. And then also your other partner, if they're not as skilled a bicyclist, um, you can't uh, lose the faster of the two of you. Like you're on two separate bikes, you know, one person can take off, the other person left in the dust. Um, this way you're glued together and you can have conversations and uh, have a good time together. And electric bikes, you see a thicker tube here for electric batteries. So electric bikes are awesome. And this is actually would be, you know, it's like a city hybrid electric bike here. because you've got a rack, you've got fenders, you've got a little bit of lower tube so you could possibly get your leg through the middle. Electric bikes are super practical and very efficient as well. They do are heavier than a regular bike. You've got the battery and they've got the motor, but then they've got more power. You've got like a second person there helping you pedal without the full weight of a second person. So they're very practical to get you to work faster with less sweat um and and just faster and they're fun um and we have actually a, a course that focuses on electric bikes and we'll be mentioning electric bikes periodically but there's a, a lot about electric other piece of information about electric bikes i could share with you um that we will during this course or you can ask in questions oh, and I, i'm just responding to a question will there a recording this email be sent to reg registrants yes i am recording this and you will all get a link to the uh, recording Okay, regardless of the type of bicycle you choose to get, you do need to make sure your bicycle is fitted to you to make um, bicycles kind of like shoes. If you have an uncomfortable shoe, it's miserable walking in it. The same with a bike. You want to make sure the bike is adjusted to you to make it very comfortable for you to ride. First off, you want to make sure you get the right size bicycle frame, depending on the style of bike. You want to be able to straddle the bike and not hurt yourself if the bar is really high. Um, when the bar is really high, you can lift the front rear wheels off the ground and there should be one or two inches of space between the wheels, and the floor of a road bike when, you know, the bike's resting against you. Or, you know, you just want clearance of one to two inches on a road bike and three to four inches with a uh, mountain bike, typically. They got a lot more clearance because you're just jumping and going over more things with a mountain bike or a hybrid bike. Okay, so here are all of the parts of a bike. I'm just going to go through these um, briefly. We've got the wheels, front and rear wheels, which have tires on them and rims. And you've got spokes, and you got the hub in the middle of the wheel. If we got the frame here, this is a classic triangular frame. Um, and the frame, well, actually there is um, the seat tube with a seat post collar and the seat post, which fits in that seat tube that uh, culminates with a saddle, which you spend a lot of time sitting in the saddle. So it's very important to get a comfortable one. Um, on the front part of the bike, you've got a headset through which the steering tube goes, and the fork is attached. The fork holds the front wheel. Um, on the top of the headset, which is with a steering column for the bike, there's a stem right here uh, attached to the handlebars. And on the handlebars, you'll have you, some grips. You'll have your typically your uh, shifters, gear shifters, and brake levers. Very important to make sure you know how to use your brakes. Uh, and they'll be typically uh, cabled off the shifters and brake levers, cables and housing. It'll go back to the brakes and you're shifting. You've got a rear derailleur here to shift. You've got a front derailleur on the seat tube here um, that both of these move the chain from either the chain ring from one chain ring to another in case of the front derailleur or from one cog to another in the case of the rear derailleur. And all those cogs together combined are called the cassette in the, uh, attached to the rear hub. And attach the chain rings here that the chain goes around. You've got a crank, which is this whole assembly here that has the crank arm and the pedals attached to the crank. So those provide the forward motion for your bike. If you have an electric bike, you'll have, typically have an electric motor either in the rear hub or down here uh, in the bottom bracket area, which is also called the, the bottom part of the frame called the bottom bracket, which is not labeled here, right where your crank is. So it could be a motor here, it could be a motor in the back. Uh, let's see, any questions about the parts of a bike or any questions people have about a part of the bike that they've always wondered about? 
Okay. Again, you can I, pop. I, I have a question. Yes. This this thing where the word trek is, it's diagonal and it goes from the headset down to the um the bottom bracket. Bottom bracket. What what is this called? That's called the down tube. That's called the down tube. Then yeah. what's this called? The seat post. No. This, this is the, the seat post. This is the uh, seat tube. Oh, and this is the down tube. This is the down tube here. And there's okay. a top tube, which is kind of okay. obvious across the top. And then in the back of the tube, behind the uh, seat, are these are the seat stays, these two smaller. Um, uh, and then you've got the chain stays, which are next to the chain. And that forms all parts of the frame of the bike. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so the most first most important thing to adjust in your bike to make sure it fits you is making sure you get the saddle height right. Now, if you're a beginning rider, you typically will have the saddle fairly low so you can put your feet on the ground. But as you evolve as a cyclist, you discover that having the seat that low makes it really a lot more work for you to pedal the bike. And so you wanna make sure that you get the seat high enough so that there's a slight bend in your knee when the pedal is all the way down which if the seat's that high, then it's very, you often be, well, you will be on your tiptoes on the bike if you're trying to put your feet on the ground when you're sitting in the seat. Um, okay, also when you have the saddle at the right height and you're pedaling your bike, um, the front knee when your pedals are level should be right over the center of the pedal in front. Um, and doing this, in it's hard, you know, I'm describing this in words, um, we'll actually have a, a, demo, um, a video coming up shortly. Um, but really, if you don't know how to fit your bike, um, go to a bike shop and they'll make sure the bike fits you. It's really important. Everyone's body's different and their muscular is different and your just your geometry, your skeleton's a little different. Um, and just bodies are different. So sometimes you need your bike adjusted differently than other people. And going to a bike shop can help you fit it or with a bicycle instructor, they can help you fit it. And um, trial and error also. Um, and by the way, when you do get used to riding a bike, you'll find that it's you don't really want to stop and put your feet on the ground with you in the saddle. You want to be off your saddle, which is a skill we'll practice on the uh, part two, where you get out of your saddle. So you're just on the pedals or on, and on the ground. Okay, um, and the saddle itself should be usually be level. Some people do like it angled up or down, but usually it's just it's the saddle's level. Um, you can adjust the connection of the saddle to the seat post. You move the saddle forward or back as necessary to make sure that you're um, on the proper centered over the pedals and also make sure the proper distance between you and the handlebars. Um, some people have short bodies, uh, short torsos, and so they need to um, shorten the distance between the handlebars so they don't stretch out too long. And you want to make sure everything's comfortable. And the handlebar and stem also, you can get different uh, length of stems, which can pull the handlebars closer to the saddle or push them further away from the saddle, depending on your body geometry. And also style of handlebars um, can, is varied. You see the curved ram horn style handlebars, and you have the upright handlebars, you have the swept back handlebars. Different people like different handlebars. And there's lots of different types of handlebars to make it comfortable for your hands and for your body. Again, you adjust it so you have a slight bend in your elbows when you're in the most comfortable position. And so you have bends in your legs and your elbows so that you can take up shocks. Um, you don't want to usually lock your arms out or lock your legs out. Make sure everything's comfortable. All right, here's a video on all of this. It's important to make sure your bike fits you properly. While your seat can be adjusted, frames have fixed dimensions, so be sure to find the right size frame for you. If the frame has a full top tube, straddle the bike and stand in front of the seat. If it is a road bike, there should be one to two inches of clearance between you and the bike. For a mountain or hybrid bike, there should be three to four inches. For step through bikes or bikes with a slanting top tube, Test the frame by pushing one pedal all the way down while sitting on the seat. Your knee should have a slight bend in it. The seat post can be adjusted, but should be in the middle of the range, not fully extended or touching the frame. Regardless of your frame size, this test will also make sure your seat is at the right height for a comfortable ride. Tip, mark your seat height with a permanent marker, so if someone borrows your bike, you can easily move your seat post back to your ideal position. The League of American Bicyclists, creating better bike education for everyone.
Okay, so there's a little bit about fitting your bike. Again, um, go to a bike shop. They'll help you pick the right kind of bike, make sure the bike's the appropriate frame size and fit the bike to you. Or you can talk to one of our bicycle instructors and they'll help you or a more experienced cyclist. Next up, um, before you go on a ride, you should know how to do the ABC quick check to make sure that your bike is safe for you to ride before you ride it. And this basic bike check um, will ensure your bike is in good condition and prevent crashes. So in the ABC quick check, A is for air, B is for brakes, C is for cranks, chain, and cassette. I'll start with C, all part of your drivetrain. Quick is for quick releases, and check is doing a check of your bike with a short ride before you're going to longer ride. We've got another video coming up uh, that walks you through all of that. Get ready to ride. This video covers the ABC quick check and offers a few tips when riding an electric assist bike. Start every ride with an ABC quick check to make sure your bike is in a safe working condition. Let's break it down. A is for air. Push on your tires. Each one should be firm when you press on them. Tires should be hard to the touch. If they give way to your pressure, they need to be inflated. After you have inflated your tires, check for cracks, bald spots, or loose threads. Any of these are indications of extreme wear and you should replace your tires very soon. B is for brakes. There are two types of brakes typically found on a bike, rim brakes and disc brakes. Checking to make sure you have braking power is similar on either type. Squeeze the brake levers firmly. There should be a thumbs width gap between the lever and the handlebars. If this gap is too small, the brakes need to be tightened or your pads replaced. When the lever is released, it should snap back into position. On rim brakes, check to see that the brake pad is not worn thinner than 1 eighth of an inch. Disc brake pads are harder to see. Overly worn disc brake pads will make a grinding noise when stopping as an indication they need to be replaced. C is for chain, cranks, and cassette. Check your chain by turning the pedals backwards. The chain should move freely. A lot of rust or a loose drooping chain are signs it needs to be replaced. Check the crank by wiggling both the left and right crank arms. There should be no lateral movement. If there is, tighten the bolt or take it to a mechanic. The cassette holds the gears on the rear wheel. Make sure it is clean and moves freely. Quick reminds you to check your bike's quick release levers, which may be used to secure your seat post and your wheels. They should be snug and closed. Many disc brakes will not have quick release levers. Make sure your through axle is tightened. The final part of the ABC quick check is the check ride. Before you set out, take a brief slow ride to check that your bike is working properly and nothing is loose or getting in the way of your wheel and pedal movement. Now you've performed the ABC quick check and your bike is ready to ride. Choosing to go by bike is a smart decision, and if you choose to ride an electric assist bike, there are a few additional things to consider. Of the many bikes out there, road, mountain, hybrid, cargo, and more, all of these types are now available with the option of electric assist or as an e-bike. Riding an e-bike allows a rider to haul more weight or cargo, ride for longer distances, ride faster, and go more places. When riding an e-bike, it's important to remember a few additional tips. Be mindful of your battery life and don't forget to charge your battery at the end of a ride. Take time to get a feel for the instant acceleration of the motor. Prepare for a slightly longer braking distance. Always follow the same rules of the road that you would on a traditional bicycle. And be courteous to fellow people on bikes that may be slower than you. Enjoy the ride! Okay. So any question about ABC Quick Check? Or anything else we covered today? Okay, again, you can raise your hand or pop it in the chat. Um, actually, I'm now I'm looking at Peregrine Fulton and said, what is the part of the next that cranks called? Um, so I'm not sure if you are talking about, uh, I believe it's the shape of a tube. Um, that's the, the bottom bracket is actually where the uh, cranks are connected to the bike. That was what you're asking. Okay, moving on. Um, what to wear. So one thing is if you're riding an e-bike or if you're just going a short distance or on a, a bike with fenders, um, 
consider riding just in your everyday clothes. You don't need anything special. The fenders and other parts of the bike help protect you from like the chain and the wheels and things. Um, you can use a leg band to keep your chain out of or your your pant leg out of the chain. Um, when riding in the cold, it's really helpful to have layers because um, a bicyclist you heat up quite a bit, and that way you can like, remove layers to make sure you, you control your temperature and the amount of moisture you have near your body appropriately. So yeah, you can wear normal clothes. Um, now, actually, let me go back to clothing a little bit. So I, you'll notice I'm actually wearing a bike jersey. I got you know climate right bike jersey here. Um, you'll see me in biking clothes a lot of the time because I'm typically riding a lot everywhere during the day. And biking clothing uh, does um, it doesn't collect sweat very much. It keeps me cool and dry and comfortable. Um, and because I'm exercising a lot, and I'm just going longer distances or hauling heavier things. For equipment, uh, you should always have a bike lock uh, if you're leaving your bike anywhere unattended. Um, and you may want to have a carrying system, like uh, a rack for panniers or a rack here for to put a bag on so you can carry stuff with you. So it's not just carrying you, but it's carrying your luggage with you. Lights and reflectors are crucial as well. We'll go into more detail in a minute about lights and reflectors. Uh, so with my commuting bike, um, I've got rack front and rear. I've got fenders. Um, I've got baskets in the back that are metal baskets, that grocery bags. And we'll, come, we'll have a picture later on of that. So I, I can carry a lot of stuff. So I, carry, I commute on that bike to work. I shop on that bike. Um, I pull trailers with that bike. Um, so I've got lots of stuff hooked up to my bike. Helmet fit is extremely important. So you want a comfortable helmet. Now, um, a lot of people in Europe don't wear helmets at all. And riding a bike by itself, you know, ride a bike whether you wear a helmet or not. It would be really good for the environment. Um, but helmets do protect your head. And they're, in, in recreational use at least, um, bike crashes are a leading cause for head injuries. Note, though, that um, we have more head injuries due to motor vehicle crashes inside of motor vehicles than we actually have on bikes. So if you think about it, everyone in a motor vehicle should be wearing a helmet too. But uh, helmets are kind of useful. They make you more visible. This one's black, but my, my helmet is typically uh, uh, some bright color so everyone sees me. Um, and my helmets also, I, I mount lights on them. I have my mirror on them. In fact, I've got my helmet right here. So I've got a nice white helmet. I've got a, a light on the top or a red, a red in the back, a white in the front. And I got my mirror attached to my helmet. So when I take my helmet off, my, my mirror and lighting system, one of my lighting systems goes with the helmet. Um, so I really appreciate having a good helmet. It keeps the sun off um, a little bit also. I've got, a, you notice I've got a visor on my helmet, another useful thing. So I can tip my head forward, or the visor down, and it helps block the sun, which is nice. Or if it's raining, you know, I have to keep my, um, my uh, um, rain off my eyeglasses. Um, okay, so making sure the helmet fits. You want two fingers between your eyebrows and the front edge of the helmet. That's area one here. So no more than two fingers. You want to make sure the helmet protects your forehead if you fall on your face. Um, the side straps here should make a Y with the connection between the straps being just under your ear. If the connection is like way down here under your chin, um, that's not going to stabilize the helmet that well. You want the um, this Y piece or this connection between these two straps to be right under your ear. A lot of the newer helmets now are not even adjustable. They just have it in the right spot, but there's still quite a few helmets that have this be adjustable and then you've got to fiddle with it to get it in the right position. Um, you know, adjustability is nice because some people, you know, have different hairdos and they have different things they're wearing on their head, um, but the non-adjustable ones are more foolproof. Um, finally, for number three, you want less than half an inch um, between your chin and the strap, which actually this two finger test. You can slide two fingers in there between the chin strap and your chin, and you can still talk. You see, you want it fairly snug, but not too snug. So it's like the, um, if this uh, Santa Clara uh, Public Health Department has this helmet fitting thing. They have the two finger test. It's two fingers in the forehead, two fingers in the straps, and do the Y piece for the underneath your ear. Bike parking. Um, if you leave your bike outside, you want really strong locks. So here you'll see a U-lock here, locking the frame and the tire to a big hole outside. Lock both wheels and the frame. So here they've added a cable. So they've locked the rear wheel as well as the front wheel, as well as the frame to a pole. And you take removable accessories with you. Um, and you should register your bike with bikeindex.org or project529.com slash garage. These are the two biggest 
bike registries, that almost all of the cities in the United States, if they're doing any bike registration, they're using one of these two services. Um, so Sunnyvale and my city uses bikeindex.org. Um, at Stanford, Palo Alto, they use project529.com slash garage uh, to register their bike. So um, yeah, the universities, uh, cities, uh, registry bikes, so it, it, uh, if it is found after it's stolen, it can be returned to you. Now, going back to take removable accessories, um, taking all the accessories off your bike can definitely be a pain. Because in my case, I've got a, a tool bag, I've got my pump, I've got my front light, my rear light, I've got my speakers. And it's like I'm taking all the stuff off my bike if I lock it up outside, which is a huge pain. It's very time consuming. Um, locking your bike up outside is kind of like taking the key out of your car so that people can drive away, but leaving the doors open and just letting people, you know, take whatever they want out of your car. And if you had to take all the stuff out of your car every time you parked it, you'd appreciate what it's like to be a bicyclist a lot of the time and how insecure it is to biking around. I really enjoy uh, bike lockers. Um, in fact, do we have a picture of them coming up here? Oh, no, not yet. Um, bike lockers are a great option. I, I think there is a picture coming up here. So that way, it, it's a security cage that stays stationary. You don't have to carry around with you and you move your bike into it and then you don't have to take all the accessories off. Also with bike parking, you want a secure and visible location. So um, you want a big, strong pole, not a weak sapling or not something's easily cut or you, something you lift your bike off. Having a visible location. A lot of people put the bike parking hidden away and that's very dangerous because then someone can work and cut things off your bike and people won't see them. So ideally near the front entrance, like right dead in front of the entrance, which makes it much convenient for you because you just see bike parking is right there near the front door. Ideally, bring the bike inside with you. Uh, most all of the places I've worked in the past 15 years, actually, I've been able to roll my bike into work um, or roll it inside of my house. Um, when I go shopping, I roll my bike inside because I use my bike as my shopping cart. And my bike's about the same size as the shopping cart. I've got baskets on it. So that solves the security issue and also solves um, reduces my time going shopping. Like in the grocery store, it's quick. I just roll it in, shop in the baskets, roll it out, and then I'm home. So it's actually as fast or faster for me to shop on my bike as it is to drive. So if I drive, I've got to park, I've got to get my bags out, I've got to get a shopping cart, load the shopping cart up, then roll it out to the car, then you know move the shopping cart back. Um, and if you don't have bike parking or if there's not, there isn't any, um, request it. And let's see. Oh yeah, I've got a one comment that that helmet looks higher than two fingers. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Just make sure the helmet covers your uh, your forehead. Um, Jordan asks, do you have a suggestion of a minimum width of the U-lock and the cable lock so that they aren't easily broken open? Um, so with U-locks, um, find the smallest U-lock that services your bike. Um, because the bigger the U-lock, the more space there is to get tools in there and break that lock. And there are a few different techniques to break U-locks, even though they're they're really beefy and strong. Um, and with cable locks, cables themselves are very easy to cut with just little hand tools. Um, but any lock, if you've got an angle grinder, an angle grinder is a battery powered, very powerful tool. It can cut through pretty much any lock fairly quickly. It makes a lot of noise and sparks, but it can slice through locks pretty fast. Um, so you'll have to experiment about the length of your lock and the cable that you're using with it to figure out what suits best with your bike. And you wanna make everything as short as you can to fit your bike so you don't carry extra weight. And so you don't have a lot of slack. Or if you've got something longer, you're sort of wrapping around the bike a little bit more. Uh, they've got extra slack. It makes it easier for them to find a spot to cut. Um, and again, bike lockers are awesome. And just bring your bike inside, then you can skip the lock entirely in the time it takes to lock everything up. I really like uh, just rolling my bike inside. Um, here's some examples of locks. Here's a cable lock, which is easy to cut. This one uses a key. Some use a combination. Combinations are nice because you don't have to carry a key with you and you can share that with other people. Um, chain padlocks uh, typically have a key also. These are heavier and more secure than a cable lock, but they're also heavier, more carrying more stuff. The U-lock uh, isn't as flexible as it were, and it can't get around as much stuff, but it is the strongest lock that we generally see in common use. Um, and this is a kryptonite one. And the kryptonite series, a lot of locks, um, they, they vary in the, the size and their the hardness of the steel and their thickness and the style of key. Um, if you're in a city a lot, or like Stanford's a high uh, bike crime area, as is San Francisco, um, you want to use locking skewers with your wheels. You don't have to worry about locking the wheel so that the 
be um, you have to have a special tool to take the wheels off the bike. Then you can just lock your frame or just lock a wheel. And then you have to worry about everything else being locked down. You can get some special skewers. Um, that sort of defeats the purpose of quick release wheels, which allow you to get the wheel off faster, to get in and out of a car or to fix a flat more quickly. Um, so it's like a pro and a con. Yeah, it's more secure, but then it takes more time when you're doing maintenance or just going in and out of a car if you have to move your bike. Um, when you lock your um, bike, you should look at using the rear triangle. So in this case, they've got the U-lock here going across the chain stays so that anchors the frame and also that anchors the rear wheel at the same time. So you get the wheel, rear wheel and the frame using this rear triangle here. Um, also, they've made a note here, they've used a cable to secure the saddle to the frame. You can actually get a, you can make your own security chain or you can buy them. A lot of, pe a lot of people have really nice saddles and they'll get stolen very quickly. And so you want to make sure someone doesn't run off of your saddle. Um, and he, in this case, they've also used a cable. They've looped this cable around the front wheel so someone can't run off with the front wheel as easily. Um, they've got the, both wheels and the frame secured. And then they've, they've secured it to these U-racks, which for an outdoor locking space, these U-racks that are embedded at two ends on the ground are the strongest thing to that. You lean your bike up against it and lock it down. The other style of rack where you put the front wheel in or the rear wheel into this like rack, that sort of supports the bike up but most bicyclists call those wheel bender racks because your bike often falls over and bends the wheel and you can't really lock the bike really effectively in those racks either. That's the old school when people didn't worry about bike theft. And some people take off the front wheel entirely. Like with a quick release wheel, you can pop the wheel off and then you can lock both wheels and the frame with one U-lock without using a cable. And this is the most secure way to lock down the bike. And, that, and the less space you give for people to maneuver a tool around this U-lock makes it harder to cut. But I would not leave a bike um, outside in San Francisco overnight, even with a really super duty U-lock. Uh, some bicycle tourists who were visiting me made that mistake of locking the bikes outside, even though they had super strong locks, and they found the parts of the lock left behind and their bikes were gone the next day. <laughs> and this is a bike locker. So um, this particular bike locker is from a company called Bike Link, which is the standard now for a lot of the bike lockers in the San Francisco Bay Area and actually across the United States. These are the best bike lockers um, ex that exist in the United States. Uh, the reason for that is they're stainless steel cages and they've got a good roof on them. So when you put your bike in, it's sheltered from weather. It's, it's heavy duty metal. So uh, it would take a lot of work to saw through this metal. Um, the locks are very secure. And they're electronic locks, so that you use your car, your secure, security card to unlock the bike locker, and only you can re-unlock that bike locker, um, other than the company itself. But they're also times so you just pay like one or two cents per hour that you're in there. So it's really cheap to lock, uh, to put your bike in there. But they are timed out. So some bike lock, some of these bike link lockers will allow your bike to be in there for one or two days. Some will, uh, like at um, Duraden Station or the airport, will allow you stay keep bike in there for two to three weeks. They don't want you to keep a bike in there indefinitely, though, because that would just lock the locker up so no one else could use it. Also, um, there was a problem with homeless people, you know, living in these lockers. So they, <laughs> so they're trying to eliminate that. We need to get real houses for homeless people, not have them live in bike lockers. And we also need to make sure the bike lockers are available for everyone to use. So the bike link locker system that um, BART and Caltrain and VTA and a lot of businesses have standardized on, these are the best because they're monitored electronically. Um, people just use them for short duration. You have a high chance of finding a bike locker. The previous system where they had reserved bike lockers. The purpose it would pay for the reservation, but the bike locker would often be empty most of the time and no one else could use it. Versus the bike link lockers, you have first come, first serve, but they, they just work very well. And this is, um, if I can't bring my bike inside, this is my preference for having a bike link locker. In fact, I've got two cards that I can, I often pull a trailer. So I've, I can park my trailer in one locker and I can park my bike in the other locker if I have to use it at a bike link, I lock it up in a bike link locker. Okay. Always lock up your bike when it is unattended, even if it's just for a few minutes. When parking your bike, it is best to find a location that is highly visible to you and others, not secluded. If you're parking your bike at night, look for a well-lit parking spot too. An inverted U-rack or a hitch post is best. If dedicated bike parking is not available, find something that is anchored down and strong near the front entrance of your destination. 
Make sure that your parked bike does not impede other users. Use a U-shaped lock, a steel cable lock, or a combination of the two. Always take any accessories that can be easily and quickly removed or lock them to the bike. Riding on the sidewalk may seem like a good option, but most of the time it is not. Riding on the sidewalk in denser, more urban areas can be dangerous and is often illegal. This is even more true when you are riding an e-bike. When riding on the sidewalk, you'll have to deal with pedestrians, signs, trash cans, and more. These are all obstacles that can be difficult to maneuver around and can make a sidewalk too crowded for bike use. Plus, drivers are typically not expecting a person traveling faster than walking speed on a sidewalk. This can be dangerous for a bicyclist when drivers are turning or pulling out of a driveway or side street. There may be times when riding on the sidewalk makes sense, like if you are going a short distance to a parking spot or if there is a wide sidewalk with little foot traffic and few crossings along a high-speed road. In this case, moderate your speed, yield to pedestrians, and be very cautious at crossings. Enjoy the ride! There's a little uh, video about bike parking and sidewalk riding. Okay, uh, on to rules of the road, because most of your bicycling should be, or well, on road or trails, but roads are inevitable and bicycles and cars can interact very successfully as long as everyone follows the rules of the road. And the, the short answer is if you ride like you are a car, you will be the safest you can be on a road shared with cars because cars know what to expect from other cars. If you pretend you're a car, you're generally pretty good. Um, so, and also your safety and the perception of other people about bicycles depends on how you behave uh, as a bicyclist with cars. So if you do crazy things, um, uh, car drivers say, oh, bicyclists are crazy people. I can't trust them to do anything right. You have the same rights and duties as a motorist on the roadways. You should always obey traffic signals and stop signs and other road signs. Um, ride with traffic and use the rightmost lane that serves your destination. And you'll see this, this is on the test, by the way. So your rightmost lane that serves your destination. We'll go over what that looks like. Also, be predictable. Make sure your intentions are clear. So we use hand signals to signal the direction we're going. We also use road position to signal the direction we're going. Ride in a straight line and don't swerve between parked cars. Um, if you duck into what looks like the furthest right that you could ride and it's between parked cars, that takes you out of the visibility for other car drivers. And when you pop back out in front of them, they hit you because they didn't see or expect you to be popping out in front of them. A signal your turns, um, look around you over your shoulder, check behind you before making a turn or changing lanes. Um, just like a car driver, you check first before you make your move. <clears throat> and be conspicuous, ride where people can see you, which often means you're riding in the middle of a lane, which a car driver may think that's annoying, but that actually often is the most safe place for you to ride. And we'll go over more on that in a little bit. Wear bright clothing. So I've got this bright jersey on. I, um, if I'm wearing regular clothing, I've got a, a vest I throw on. I'm being very conspicuous by being very bright and visible. At night, use a white front light and a red rear light or red rear reflectors at dusk and in bad weather. Um, I ride with both reflectors and lights. And during the daytime, I often use a, a daytime flashing lights as well, just to make sure I get attention. It's very helpful to make eye contact with drivers at stop signs, um, or if they're turning, they see you, you see them, you can see what they're looking at. Um, typically don't ride on sidewalks, although there are situations where the sidewalk can be the best place to ride, depending on the situation, it's all very situational. But when you're on a sidewalk, you should move at pedestrian speeds, as was pointed out by the video earlier. You also want to think ahead. You're biking and driving defensively. You're anticipating what's happening around you and, and no, noticing what a driver or a bicyclist or pedestrian is going to do before they may even realize they're going to do it. A watch for turning vehicles. Uh, you can see their signals or see the position of them on the road. And very important, stay outside of the door zone which uh, we'll be going over more. You want to be at least five feet away from parked cars because the door will pop open three to four feet away from the car, which you could hit. And then you want an extra foot of clearance, a startle zone. 
so that when the door pops open, you know, suddenly you move off into traffic unexpectedly and they get hit by a car that way. And if you do get hit, if you do hit a door, that typically won't kill you. It may break some bones or hurt you badly, but typically won't kill you. But what kills you is you'll bounce out into traffic after you hit the door and then someone will run you over and that will kill you. And that's happened to several people. Um, look out for debris and potholes and other road hazards on the side of the road. And that may make it not safe for you to ride um, right against the right edge of the road. The law says you ride as far right as practicable. Practical means you can't ride through parked cars. You shouldn't be riding over glass. You can't ride through potholes or water or tree branches. Um, so you may need to actually ride in the, in the middle of a lane, a traffic, a regular car traffic lane, as you think of it. Across railroad tracks at right angles. Um, railroad tracks, the metal, especially when it gets wet, gets very slippery. When I was riding in Boston, um, they had streetcars and they had a lot of rail tracks in the roadways. And that was um, my most frequent cause of uh, a fall riding on Boston was at, during the rain. I hit the tracks going the wrong way and it'd take your wheel out from under you. So try to cross rail tracks at, at the right an angle as you can. If it's dry, it's not as much of an issue, but when it's wet, wow, they, those metal gets really slippery. And make sure you, you're ready to ride. Um, you want to do ABC quick checks so you know your equipment is functioning properly to help you ride safely. Carry tools and supplies that are appropriate for your ride. Um, since I'm a bike commuter and a bicycle tourist, I typically carry all the tools with me. I need to repair just about anything that goes wrong with my bike. Um, so get a flat, I get even break a spoke, I can fix it all wherever I am. Um, so I can keep going. I don't have to go to a, a car garage to get a tow. I can just fix it myself and keep going. Uh, highly recommend wear a helmet for visibility purposes, for safety purposes. Your helmet is your very, very last line of defense. You want, ideally, you'll never have to wear, use your helmet, but if you do have to use it, then it's there to protect you. Okay, some bike handling basics, um, which will cover a lot more on the on person, or the uh, on bike piece. You um, getting on and off your bike properly. Steering and stopping, steering in a straight line, shifting, scanning, and signaling are all the basics of bike handling. And we cover these in some detail um, in the parking lot uh, with the Smart Cycling Part 2 course we offer. It's just hard to uh, do these in a lecture. You just need to practice them in person. Okay, um, with shifting gears, um, they help a rider um, exert nearly the same amount of effort, pedaling effort across a wide variety of terrain. And you're always looking for the gear that makes it the most comfortable for you to ride. You're trying to have your feet and your legs move at about the same speed, whether you're going up a mountain or down a mountain or on the flats, um, just make it more efficient for your body. So your gears help you do that. Um, your drivetrain has a chain, chain rings in the front and gears in the back and the derailleurs. Um, let's see, when you shift, you want to make your shifting smooth, and which means you don't want to have a lot of pressure on your pedals. You want to be pedaling. You have to pedal for this type of gear to shift. And by the way, if your bike has the gear, exposed gears, this is the kind of gearing I'm talking about. There are also um, internal hubs and other gear shifting mechanisms that are you can't see the gears. Um, those uh, have different ways of shifting, but for... Um, for this, the most traditional kind of bike, the most common form of shifting, you need to just pedal gently forward when you do your shift of your front and rear derailleur. You want to make sure your chain is well lubricated. Um, look at your chain and you can tell whether it's well lubricated or it's rusty. Um, here it says replace your chain every 1,500 to 2,000 miles. Um, on the East Coast where it's really wet and raining a lot, yeah, that might be the case. Um, if you lubricate your chain properly with a good wet lube on the East Coast where it's raining a lot or a good dry lube on the West Coast where it doesn't rain, rain very much, um, I usually get five to 6,000 miles from my chains. And I'm actually giving them a lot of hard use. Um, so it depends on your riding style, depends how well you maintain your chain. Uh, you can get a lot more um, miles out of your chain. Okay, back to shifting. So on flat level ground, you'll typically want to use the middle of your gear. So the middle of the cassette in the back and the middle of the chain ring in the front. Um, we'll practice shifting a lot or to some extent uh, during part of like in part two. This will sort of give you the middle of the road, as it were, gear for you to ride in. 
Um, when you want to go up a hill, you want to be in the lowest gear. And the lowest gear will be when your chain is closest to the bike, which means you're on the biggest cog in the back and you're on the littlest chain ring on the front. And the numbering on your levers, there may or may not have numbering on your front and rear derailleur or um, shifting levers. Um, and they don't, aren't always consistent in what a one means. Sometimes one means highest gear. Usually one means lowest gear, but sometimes different shifting systems are different. Um, I generally shift based on feel. If it feels good to my body, I'm happy. And so I shift into whatever gear makes my, my legs happy. But going up a hill, it's nice to have low gear so you can climb a hill more easily. Um, pushing really hard on your pedals gives you more stress to your body and particularly your knees. Um, so you wanna keep your knees in good healthy condition uh, so they serve you well. And so it helps if you spin your pedals more, which your legs are moving faster, but you're not putting as much force through your knees. And then when in a high gear, when you're going down a hill, you want to pedal, you want to have your, um, you want to be in the highest gear, which is the littlest cog in the back and the biggest chain ring in the um, front so that you don't have to spin your legs too fast to get down the hill or if you have the wind behind you. So you can keep providing force going forward to go a little faster. Um, but you want to be in your highest gear um, during those times. And if you're going down a really big hill or have a really big wind, you don't have to pedal at all. Just coast and enjoy, enjoy your momentum. Um, for best results with um, this gear and sprocket system that we've got for shifting, it's best not to have the biggest cog in the back and the biggest chain ring in the front or the littlest one and the littlest one on both sides. That puts the most side to side motion. It, it basically twists your chain the most, which causes the most wear on the chain as well as your gears. And it may make extra noises also. We're trying to keep the chain relatively straight. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about this. Most of the modern uh, chains and, braking, or, and gear systems can handle this, but it is a, a more advanced tip um, to, it's called cross chaining and it, it reduces your efficiency and increases wear. Okay, here is a little video on starting, stopping, and shifting. Starting, stopping, and shifting are important skills to master to ride confidently and safely. To start, straddle the bike and stand in front of the seat. Okay, notice he's standing in front of the seat. He's not on the seat when he's getting going. Is either pedal in the upright position around the one or two o'clock position. We also call this the power pedal start where the, uh, the, um, the crank arm is pointing forward and you've got your starting foot on top of it. So that when you push down on it, you can take off fast. Push the pedal down and ease yourself onto the seat. Place your other foot. And notice that when he pushes down on the pedal, it gets him going and also lifts him up higher. So at that point he's hopping into the seat rather than trying to sit on the seat to start with. So you actually, the act of taking off gets you into the seat as well as gets you going forward. On the pedal and begin pedaling. Hint, it is always easier to start in a low gear so that pedaling is easier. To stop, stop pedaling and put one pedal at the bottom of the pedal stroke. Shift your weight to the pedal closest to the ground. Squeeze both brakes equally. Slide off the seat. Place the other foot on the ground. So here, um, it's hard to tell that he did sort of slide forward, but at one point he was still on his seat and on tippy toes. But if you slide forward to your seat, that way you can have your foot solidly planted on the ground. You're not on tiptoes, so you're more stable. Most bikes have gears that help a rider exert nearly the same amount of pedaling effort across a variety of terrain. Here are some key tips to remember when shifting gears. Shift gears when you are pedaling smoothly and rhythmically. Most shifting is done with your right hand, which shifts in small changes. Your left hand controls bigger changes in your pedal effort. And so the right hand is for the rear, which you so see your right brake is for the rear brake. The right hand is shifting the rear derailleur. The left hand is shifting the front chain rings. And though, um, think of the chain rings and shifting there as gear ranges. So your left hand is controlling gear ranges, like a low range, mid range, high range, versus the right hand is controlling smaller shifts when typically it's one you use most often. Is used less frequently. The farther your chain is from the center line of your bike, the harder it is to pedal. Use these gears when you have momentum, such as going downhill. When your chain is closer to the center line of your bike, it is easier to pedal. Use these gears when pedaling becomes more difficult, such as when you are traveling uphill. 
Anticipate the need to change gears and try to shift just before you start to push too hard. And anticipating what you gear you need to be in before you hit the hill or before you go down the hill, but, but particularly going up the hill, is really important. Because if you start in a really high gear, you can get stuck and say, ah, I can't pedal, I'm stuck. And then with this kind of gear shifting, it's really hard to shift when you, you, can't, you can't shift when you stop very easily. You have to pick up your rear wheel of your bike and move it with your hand to shift to lower gear, which sometimes people do, but this is very awkward to do when you're on the road. Um, with internal gear hubs, um, they're kind of cool because a lot of them allow you to shift while you're not moving. And so if you're stopped or if you're stuck in a hill, you shift it and you're automatically in the other gear without having to move the chain. But with these derailleur systems, you have to have the chain moving in order for the chain to move from one gear to the other. Or spin too fast. Smooth and efficient shifting requires practice. So get out there and enjoy the ride. Okay, actually, I'm, I'm catching up with some of my comments that April put in here. Yeah, um, April sees a lot of people not following a straight line. Riding in a straight line is one of the fundamental pieces to making sure you stay safe. Um, also, streetcar tracks, are, yeah, you're running into those in San Francisco. And we've got them in San Jose as well. So um, trying to make sure you go across uh, streetcar tracks is really important. Okay, so I've got those couple of comments taken care of. And let's keep going on our start. Okay, so looking around or scanning is extremely important for a bicyclist. We are very dependent on knowing everything around us. So we need to get good practice looking over our shoulder. Um, so before you take a smart cycling part two, you should be comfortable riding in a straight line and looking over your shoulder to see what's around you. It also helps communicate to other people that, hey, they're looking at something and maybe I should be paying attention to what they're looking at because that may be where they're moving. Uh, and it's very important to learn how to ride in a straight line while you look over your shoulder. So when we make a turn or when we shift lanes, we look first, just like we would in a car, to scan first, then we signal about 100 feet prior to our turn hold that signal for four to six seconds, which is a long, long time. Most people, some people just flip their arm up and then it comes down again. And it's like, were they waving high for someone? No, keep your arm out there, hold it, count like a few times and then lower to make sure everyone sees it. Scan again and then make your turn. Um, well, I, I yes, I will be talking more about mirrors. And we, I, we actually talk about those in a little bit more. Um, mirrors are really helpful and I use my mirror which I showed you on my helmet. I use a helmet-based mirror, but there's also mirrors on bicycles. Um, yeah, we can talk about more about those in a bit. I wanna get through a little bit more, so then we can take a break. Um, let's see. Okay, and we got another thing on scanning and signaling. Signaling and scanning are an important way everyone on the road communicates with each other. By indicating and making predictable movements, we can more safely share space on the road together. Signaling your change of direction not only makes you safer, but it's also required by law for drivers and for people on bikes. Before signaling or changing your direction, look behind you to see if it is clear. Looking or scanning also communicates to other road users that you are about to change lanes or directions. So even if you are riding with a mirror and know what's behind you, turn your head as a way of communication. Pro tip for maintaining a straight line when scanning, Whichever direction you are turning your head, take your hand on that side of your body off the handlebar and place it on your hip as you scan. At the same time, or directly after your scan, signal your intention to change lanes or turn. Signal a left-hand turn by fully extending your left arm out to the side. And notice he was preparing for left turn. So even though there's a bike lane here, he's in this main lane because he's shifting lanes to make a left turn here. That's why he's not riding the bike lane. To signal a right turn, fully extend your right arm out to the side. A more traditional style of a right turn signal is to bend your left arm up at a right angle with your hand flat. Signal in advance of your turn for about three to five seconds so that both of your hands can be on the handlebars during the turn. And that's one very important thing. It is extremely important for you always to maintain control of your bicycle. So if um, you're going down a really steep hill and you have to maintain control of your bicycle, it's not required that you signal. Highly recommended that you signal, but 
maintain control of your bicycle first. Get your signaling done, and before you do your turn, have both hands on the your uh, handlebar so you have really good control of your bicycle when you make your maneuver. It is good practice to let others know when you are slowing or stopping. This is critical if you are stopping outside of an intersection or there are other road users behind you. Now for cars, you definitely want to use a stop signal to use signal to them. For bicyclists, they'll often combine that with talking to the other bicycle around them. Say, they'll say stopping. You also hear it in case they want to keep their hands on the handlebars. Show you are planning to stop by extending your left arm out and at a downward angle. If there are other bicyclists behind you, it is good practice to also yell, stopping or slowing. Use your time riding in parks or separated from traffic to get comfortable signaling and scanning while sharing the road. Practice scanning and signaling often, all the time if possible. Enjoy the ride. So smart cycling part two, one of the things you have to pass is making sure that you can scan signal scan in the parking lot before we go on the road. We'll be checking that as part of smart cycling part two. Okay, um, we're at a first break time. So I'll first ask for questions and I hear I'll answer the mirror question, which they alluded to a little bit. Mirrors are extremely useful so that you don't have to turn your head all the time. So when I'm commuting, I really like just paying attention to what's behind me by looking in my mirror that's on my helmet. But when I'm making a turn, it is best always to turn your head to make sure you're seeing everything because the mirror could inadvertently not catch something. Now with a helmet mounted mirror or an eyeglass mounted mirror like this, I can just turn my head just a little bit and I can move the mirror a little bit. I can actually see more behind me than you could in a car mirror. Um, Cause the car mirrors are fixed and turning my head is not gonna make much difference. But turning this allows the mirror to actually really scan a lot of stuff. Getting used to this kind of mirror though, on your helmet or on your eyeglasses is very challenging at first. Make sure you ride in a really quiet area or practice in a parking lot where there are no cars around because it is very distracting getting used to this kind of mirror. But once you get used to it, you feel like you're blind if you don't have a mirror <laughs> when you're biking. Um, so as a bicycle commuter and as a bicycle tourist, um, I really, this, this kind of mirror setup is great. I also, um, this one is from, um, a com I, I think it's called Bike Peddler. It's a take a look mirror. It's all metal with just the little plastic um, the, for the mirror piece. But this all metal is really good because it's very, um, if, if you hit it or catch it, it bends rather than breaking. I used to use a plastic one that kept, I kept breaking it off. And I, I, you know, they're really hard to repair. The metal just bends. And this one actually is meant to go on eyeglasses, but I've attached it on my um, visor here. Um, I've just used a little clip and then I wrapped a, a twist tie around it to make sure it doesn't get slipped off. So it, it stays fairly on there fairly good. And this, even though the eyeglass one is meant for eyeglasses or it can fit on a visor, if you didn't have that, you can still like tape it or glue it to your helmet or um, create some little holes. You can create some basic mounting areas for it um, and mount it just about any kind of helmet. There are other ones um, that come with adhesive um, uh, that you can glue to your helmet. So you can do that with this metal thing also. You get one of those adhesive things and lash it down. So I really like a mirror, but don't rely only on it for when you're doing turns. Um, and there's different, you know, um, for the helmet mirror, a small one works just fine because you can move it around and see everything. Some people put really big mirrors they want to see a lot more at once. But when you have a really big mirror, it can block more of your vision forward in that size. So I like the smaller one because I can move it around and see what's behind the mirror. Um, you can have mirrors on your handlebars on your bike also. Um, the problem with those is um, they don't show you as much of what's be happening behind you. And when your bike falls over, they tend to break or get out of alignment or adjustment. So um, it's extra thing on your bike. So I, I prefer personally the helmet mount mirror, but some people are happy with mirrors on their handlebars like they would with a motorcycle or in a car. Um, so Nancy, did I answer all your mirror questions? Do you have any other questions in the mirror space? Uh, Nancy, I can't, I see your lips moving, but I can't hear you. And I, I'm not showing you as muted. So I think maybe your audio isn't hooked up the right way. So you can uh, enter your question in the chat. Okay. Any other questions before we have a brief break? Oh, Nancy's connecting her audio now. Let's see if this works. And if you have a question, raise your hand. And yeah, it's not connecting to your audio. Okay. So yeah, so if you can't use your audio, 
just um, um, put the question in the chat. Are we ready for a break? We'll have a five minute break. We'll come back at 7.25. Actually, we'll round it out. I'll give you uh, eight minutes here. So I'm gonna pause my video and 7.25 will keep going. So get a snack, get some water, go to the bathroom, stretch your legs. And then we'll be back and finish off the rest of this presentation.
Okay, it's 7.25, so I'm going to get rolling again. <clears throat> and we'll be covering some more principles of traffic law. And thank you again for uh, turning on your video so I can see that hey, you're there and alive. <laughs> okay, so positioning. Where should I ride on the road? Share the lane, side to side, or take the lane, which actually is sharing the road front to back. So first off, I'm gonna have a little video um, on some traffic and safety tips. All road users have a responsibility of sharing the road with others. As a person on a bike, there are a few key principles to understand so that you can be more confident and safer when cycling on the roadways. Let's start with riding in traffic. Bikes are recognized as vehicles of the road and have the same rights and responsibilities as motorists. As a person on a bike, you will most likely be a slower vehicle on the road. So position yourself in the rightmost part of the travel lane that goes the direction you are going. Ride at least a foot and a half from the edge of the road so you have space between yourself and the road's edge. You'll need this space to maneuver around debris or potholes when necessary, but do not ride in the gutter. The gutter is not a travel lane. Always ride with the flow of traffic. Obey traffic signals and be predictable. Before changing lanes, signal, look behind you to ensure no traffic is coming, and move when it is clear. Always pass on the left. As a cyclist, bike lanes make your travel more comfortable, but they are not mandatory for you to use. Be sure to ride outside of the door zone if parked cars are present along your path. When a road is narrow, position yourself in the middle of the lane so you are clearly visible. It is safer to ride further into the lane so drivers can see you. They should move over to go around you. When there is a travel lane that serves multiple directions, use the rightmost part of the lane that serves your direction. If traveling straight through an intersection, position yourself in the center of the lane. If turning left, position yourself in the left part of the lane. Remember to signal your turns, make eye contact with other road users when possible, be predictable, and follow traffic laws. You, as well as other road users, are entitled to the space you are using. This includes the space behind, to the sides, and in front of you. There are two important ways to gear up for a safer ride, lights and helmets. A front white light and a rear red light are important to have when riding at dusk, nighttime, or in clement weather. In many states, it is the law. Also, be sure to use reflective gear on your bike or on your body so that you are more easily seen by others. Helmets. A bicycle helmet is another essential layer of protection. A helmet should fit snug. It should sit on your head so there is only a two finger width space between your eyebrows and the helmet. The side strap should make a Y below your ear and there should only be a small half inch gap between your chin and the strap. Once you have these basic safety tips covered, you're ready to enjoy the ride. Okay, I'm actually going to replay this a little, some bits of this. Um, so I can actually, okay, so this particular bike lane they've got right here, this is a really well designed bike lane because you see this little extra space here. They've actually got a three foot clearance between, or three or four foot between the, where the parked cars are and where the edge of the bike lane is. So you can be anywhere in this bike lane and feel like you're safe. We want to see more bike lanes designed like this, which is why we want to get more bike advocates supporting us and talking to city planners. A lot of times you'll have door zone bike lanes where they put the bike lane right up against the door or the cars. Those are really treacherous to ride in. And so in that situation, I never bike in those areas because I don't want to get hit. I don't want to hit a car door that's popping open when I don't expect it. So I'll be actually taking the lane. Um, this lane here is also really well designed because it's got a buffer here so that cars on this side, if you're in the bike lane, aren't passing too close too. So this is buffered on both sides, which is just awesome. Um, let's see. Let me pass. Oh, here's another, another really well designed bike lane. A lot of space there on both sides. Um, they here there's a bike lane, you notice there's a bike lane here, which I wouldn't ride in because it's well. That, this is actually fairly wide. That might be it, but I think these are people are they're getting ready to take a left turn. Is there anything else I saw in this video? 
Um, yeah, this bike lane, for instance, is not as well designed. The cars are pretty much up against that line. And here he's leaving the bike lane to move around the box that we saw in the video. Um, this, this style bike lane is pretty wide though, but I would be riding right along this um, outer edge of the bike lane. So I wouldn't be in the door zone of these cars. Or if the bike lane is too narrow, I just would not take the bike lane. I'd just be in the middle. And once you're out of the bike lane, don't just hide on the side of that main lane. Be in the middle of the lane. So cars have to really pass you and go around you and not think that I can squeeze by. Cars often think they're a lot skinnier than they really are. So we need to make sure they appreciate how wide the cars are. Okay. Let me keep going. Okay. So uh, positioning. You've got lane positioning, which you just saw in that video, you know, how far you are side to side. You have speed positioning also, which is where you are in lane based on how fast you're going. Um, changing lanes, um, you know, control where you want to be positioned. And especially when you're at intersections, you want to figure out where you'll be at an intersection. So let's take a look at this. So lane position, a person on a bike has a basic right to use the road, just like a car is. Um, and you can use that full space of a lane as necessary to make sure that you're safe and you're operating fine. Um, bikes look skinny, but they also, they kind of, they can wander very quickly side to side. So they need to have maneuvering room on them. Cars um, won't have, don't need as much maneuvering room to go side to side because they're more stable on the four wheels rather than two wheels. Um, the safest place for you to be is often right in the middle of whatever lane you're occupying. So that you stick out like a sore thumb. It's very obvious and you just own that lane. You aren't hiding on the far right, you know, being scared of the cars. Um, you you got to take possession of that. And um, the cars can smell your fear. <laughs> so if you're hiding on the side, they'll take advantage of that. <laughs> um, speed positioning. So if you're all moving slowly, you, again, take the lane and just be front to back in, um, you know, in that lane. Also, only pass on the left. If you pass on the right, you can catch a right-turning car by surprise. They aren't expecting someone to go by them. Um, so pass on the left, just like a car would pass. That's where a car is expecting other people to pass them. When you're changing lanes, you want to scan, signal, scan, yield to any oncoming traffic that's too close to you, um, and then move smoothly over. Sometimes they do need to be fairly aggressive, though, because you can't necessarily wait for all the traffic to go by. But like a car, you'll want to move in front of them when they have enough reaction time so they aren't surprised by you moving. So you scan, make sure it's clear, signal your intentions, and then move the lane over. So this person is moving over from one lane where there's a share over here over into a left turn lane so they can make a, left, a vehicular left turn. And, and move you know, slowly and confidently. Don't you know, move very suddenly and unexpectedly. When you reach an intersection, you want to be in the rightmost area that serves your destination. So if you are turning right, be in sort of the right side of that lane. So even if you don't signal, people say, oh, he's sort of on the right side. Maybe he's thinking of going right or she's thinking of going right. If you're right in the center, that means you're most likely going straight through that intersection uh, in the center of the next lane. If you're on the left side, left-ish side, not like far, far left, like you, so the cars try to squeeze by you, but more to the left. So it indicates, even without signaling, that you're probably going to take a left. Um, now, hopefully, drivers pay attention to where you are in the lane and pay attention to your left signals. I was actually in Sunnyvale on the left side of a lane with my arms fished out, getting ready to take a left, and some idiot car driver passed me on the left. And this other car was exiting. We would have hit them if they hadn't stopped because they were actually turning onto the roadway from where I was turning, making my left turn onto. It's like, what are car drivers thinking when they see someone signaling left and on the left side of the road, they pass them on the left and they're trying to make a turn. You know, there are um, some car drivers that need uh, remedial education, but um, do your best. And most of the time it will work out just fine. I was, so I wasn't hit because I was watching. I was being extra careful watching still, uh, but that was a little scary. Okay, again, we're in the rightmost lane that serves our destination. So like we're in this case where there's two right turn lanes. So this person who's going straight has moved over into the straight through lane across a couple of lanes. So they proceed straight across that intersection. And if you are in a complicated just lane situation, get off your bike and maneuver like a pedestrian on the sidewalk. And then you can walk across the intersection. It'll take longer and maybe more awkward, but you'll be safe. 
And, you know, sometimes they're just complicated situations in cities that they weren't well designed for handling cyclists mixing with traffic. Um, here is the case of a through and right turn lane. So again, on the, if you're on the right side, taking a right, or if you're in the through, if you want to go straight through, just be sort of more in the middle of that lane. In this case, they're on the little bit on the left, but I'd be in the center of this lane going across to this intersection. Um, let's see, are we, hmm, that's interesting. We have the double or right turn lane. I thought we just had that. Um, multiple left turn lanes. You want to be in the rightmost of the left turn lanes. Um, so here's two, unless you're doing huge, like, uh, well, in this case, it looks like there's one way. This looks like one way because this looks like parked traffic here. If you're doing a U-turn, then you'd be in the left, left lane. But in this case, they're just doing a normal left turn. So we're in the rightmost left turn lane because they're the slower traffic going around. Um, yeah, in a city like Boston, sometimes you have these intersections that have lots of different <laughs> lane markings, lots of different lanes. Yes, uh, David, you have a question. Yeah, so this, this it, at least not unusual in my experience, is I'm turning left in, onto a multi-lane road. And I get into the turn lane, but in my experience, I stay towards the right-hand side of that turn lane so that it takes me into the slowest of the lanes that I'm turning into. And the traffic can pass on my left. But I'm it's usually it's there's a lot of traffic and I've I've positioned myself, but I'm not at the leftmost of that lane. I don't know if I'm making sense, but I'm I'm yes. trying to suggest that I'd stay to the right uh, when I'm turning into multi-lane. So in that situation, for the lane that you're in, you're making left turn lane, I highly recommend that you are actually centered in that lane so that cars don't squeeze past you. And then as you go take your arc around that turn, then you can see what lane you're landing into. Um, do shoot for landing in the center, whatever lane you're going into. Often when you're doing left turn lane, there'll be a bike lane so that you'll end up veering off to the right um, and then cars can pass you. But while you're making the turn, you don't want cars to try and maneuvering past you while you're making your left in that same lane that you're in. Now, if there's two lanes, they'll one person will stay in their um, left left lane and turn that around because there'll typically be some lines in the road. But then you'll be sort of centered where you like Pretend you're a car at that situation until you get to your destination, and then you can sort out what lane you wanted to end up in if there was a bike lane at your end. Um, yeah, I have um I've seen cars try to sneak up next to bicyclists that are making left turn. They're the right, the far right side of the left turn lane. And this car is snuggled up to them. So like the right next, it's like that's dangerous. <laughs> um, because the bicycle, when they get going, they're more wobbly and they could be end up in the path of the car. So, so Tim, just to follow up on that, let's say I'm coming up and there are a couple cars in front of me. I've moved over into the left-hand turn lane, right? Yep. Um, but I'll be honest, what I tend to do is ride up the side to where I'm in front. And then I scooch over to the right so that the car, I'm turning, uh, but there is a car turning to the left of me. And I think what I, my question for you is, should I not move up to the front? Should I stay behind cars that are ahead of me in that turn lane? The safest thing is to stay behind cars that are ahead of you in the turn lane. Now, okay. motorcyclists also will uh, do the lane splitting. They'll go up the, the little split. And one be make sure you really know the light timing and the behavior of the lights. So you didn't get caught between traffic lanes and all of a sudden both take off at the same time and they can, they, end up going faster than a bicyclist. Um, so if I know the light really well and I'm in a hurry and there's like rush hour traffic, everyone's going super slow. Um, I have to admit, I, I will um, lane split myself and get myself to the front of the queue. But when I get to the front of the queue, I'll actually pull out in front of the car in, in, that's ahead of me and make sure that I'm sort of centered ahead of them, even sometimes in the crosswalk, um, so that they don't take off and try to pass by me too quickly. So I'll sort of Take advantage of my bicycle abilities, get sneak by them in a way, and get. But when I get in front of them, I'm in front of them. But that is then it's sneaking by them is risky. You're taking a risk and splitting the lane, just like a motorcyclist taking risk when they do it. Also, but you'll see motorcyclists do this quite a bit because motorcycles do accelerate very quickly, can take off faster than a car can from a light. 
Um, now, as a cyclist, I'm usually going about, the, I, I can accelerate fairly quickly. If I get into the right gear, if I shift down, um, I'll actually accelerate about as fast as the car through the intersection. Um, so I'm usually getting through them about the same speed, but it depends on your abilities. Uh, the, again, the safest thing, be a car, line up behind them, which can be frustrating though, because sometimes um, you, you have to take several cycles to get through lights, which is very upsetting. Um, the, the other thing about having cars in front of you though, cars will set off signal detectors. We can actually get to this in a little bit. Um, bicycles sometimes don't always set off um, the traffic signal, but I'll show you some tips on how to make that happen. Okay, anything more on left turns? Any other questions in this space? Okay, let's keep going. So on one-way streets with two or more lanes, um, again, make a left turn, you want to be the leftmost lane. Uh, and in this case, on the left side of this through lane to make the left turn. This is a one-way street onto one-way street. So they're, they're turning into the right lane of the one-way street they're going into, see this lane. Or if they're going straight through, they're just maintaining um, their position. And this person actually is going straight through. He should be centered, not on the right side. If this person, this uh, air, this graphic is slightly in error, this right um, cyclist, they're in a position to take a right turn, not to go straight through. Um, and here's asking you a question, waiting red lights, don't squeeze your way up to the front, but sometimes we um, do that. The safest thing is to do is to wait uh, for traffic to move. Now, um, actually in the earlier video, I'm not sure you caught it, but you had saw some cyclists getting in front of some cars that are waiting at a stoplight, you recall it from the video. They were going to something called a bike box. Um, and the bike lane is designed so that the bike lane brings them to the front. And if they want to take a left turn, they can scooch sideways to get in front of the car and then take a left turn ahead of those cars in a similar maneuver that's actually fully legal uh, to what David described earlier in, in sneaking up, uh, splitting the lane. Um, with those bike boxes, still be really cautious because you want to know that the signal is going to stay red until you're fully in the bike box and take off. Because if the guy is ready to stomp on the, you know, accelerate away from there and you're just starting to move over, you can catch him by surprise and you get clipped by a car. Um, so those bike boxes, they're good in a way because having the cyclist out in front is much safer. The car, you're obvious to the car driver. Um, but then moving sideways up there can be a little slightly risky, but hopefully you've got time to move over and then you can make a left turn more easily. The alternative is just queuing up behind the car like you would again with a standard um, uh, a car would do. Um, another thing is as a driver, I see drivers misdo this a lot. They have these bike areas. They say you know, stop behind the limit line as a driver. A lot of drivers drive into the bike box when they're not supposed to. They're supposed to be back behind them. Um, so yeah, a lot of education here. On and off ramps. Okay, this is the most challenging, or one of the most challenging things you'll be confronted with as a bicycle. So there's a multi-lane merge here coming on to a multi-lane road. Um, you need to be quite assertive and quite visible. Um, and really, you, you're owning this lane you're in, you're signaling, and you're looking and scanning um, all at the same time to handle possibly high-speed traffic. Um, I've done this many times as a bicycle tourist going across country, you know, I just was confronted with a situation. Um, it's challenging. It takes practice um, to do it. And it's kind of like when you're first learning how to merge onto a highway, coming onto a highway, you have to basically get up to speed and be at speed and feel comfortable signaling and asserting yourself to get into uh, onto a highway. In this case, you're getting, yeah, you're dealing with people who are merging on. Um, hopefully they'll see you and you see them and they'll yield to you and realize that yeah, you can't go as fast as the car. Okay, I've got another um, video here. More than half of injury causing crashes involving cars and people on bikes happen at intersections. It's important to know how to reduce your risk at these locations. How you position yourself when approaching the intersection will increase your visibility to drivers. In many instances, you may feel safer exiting the bike lane to make your turn. Combined with scanning and signaling, proper intersection positioning will let other road users know where you are going. Actually, let me go back just a little bit in this video. So, notice she um, made eye contact with the driver, so the driver let her in front because she's making a left turn to get in front of this car so she can be in that lane also. Um, so you, you've got to, the looking at the driver and communicating with your signals as well as um, your eyes is very helpful. We'll let other road users know where you are going. 
As a general rule, you want to be in the rightmost lane that is going in the direction you are traveling. For example, if you are in a lane that serves two directions, such as one lane that allows travel straight or turning right, position yourself in the center part of that lane. And something else you notice here, these actually are almost riding side by side. If you need to control a lane, having two cyclists side by side is perfectly legal. It's like two people sitting in a car side by side, right? It's legal for them, it's legal for bicyclists also. This will discourage right turning cars and trucks from passing you and dangerously cutting it. And here they're actually maintaining control of the lane here because they're going across an intersection where people are taking a right. And when the bike lane becomes dashed like this, that's an indication that bicyclists, it's okay for you to get out of that bike lane. And also cars are supposed to merge into the bike lane to use it as a right turn lane. And a lot of car drivers do not do that correctly. They're supposed to merge behind a bicyclist or um, if the bicyclist is way far back, they can merge in front of the bicyclist, make sure they're not cutting them off. And then they should take the right turn from that right turn lane and not make a sudden right turn across the lane and cut a, a cyclist off unexpectedly. In front of you to make a right turn. If you are faced with an intersection with multiple left turn lanes, be sure to position yourself in the rightmost. So she's, um, notice she's centered in that left, that rightmost left turn lane. Lane turning left. In some cities and at some large intersections. So this is another style of bike box. This is a left turn bike box. And these are really useful because you can do these box turns. You can come straight across this intersection. Here's a bike lane here. You come straight across, just move over slightly to the right, set yourself up ahead of all the traffic that's on the other side of the crosswalk so that you're well in front of the cars there and then wait for the light to turn and then proceed, um, then turn your bike in this and then proceed across. Um, these are, there's a lot of these in um, Cupertino, a lot of them in San Jose. There's some starting to show up in Sunnyvale as well in other cities in the area. There may be a two-stage turn box. This bike infrastructure helps make you safer when turning left at an intersection. To turn left using a turn box, you will ride straight through the intersection in the bike lane until you reach the turn box. And this turn box is very badly placed. This turn box should be right here in front of this U-Haul, not way over here to the right. And you'll see actually with this video, the kind of box. Stop in the turn box and re- He's blocking that right turner. And they actually had to let that person go and then picked up the video again after that person turned. So again, this, this turn box, this is, this is a bit of bad design infrastructure. It shouldn't be at this location. It should be in front of those um, people. So people that are doing a free right turn can do that. Although um, there may be a no turn on red, right and red here, possibly, that that uh, right turning person shouldn't even have done. I, I don't know. Position yourself to go straight through the intersection in the other direction on the green light. When approaching or waiting at a red light at an intersection, avoid the temptation to squeeze between stopped cars to reach the front of the intersection. Drivers are not expecting you. This can be really dangerous if the light changes and traffic starts to move. This is especially dangerous with trucks and buses whose drivers do not have good visibility to see you behind or alongside them. Keep your position in line and wait with the other road users. It is important to remember that if you feel uncomfortable about traversing an intersection, you can always get off your bike and walk your bike as a pedestrian in the crosswalks. Enjoy the ride! More okay, I'm back to riding on sidewalks. Yeah, riding on sidewalks can actually be really dangerous because a lot of people are moving, uh, bicyclists move too fast on the sidewalk. And uh, drivers going uh, out of a driveway or an intersection is not expecting a fast moving object to come off the sidewalk in front of them and they end up hitting them. Um, a girl in San Jose recently, or a few years ago was hit and killed by an SUV driver because um, she was riding really fast and leaving school and the, they ran over her. Um, so if you do ride on a sidewalk, basically move at pedestrian speeds when you're on the sidewalk. That's the safest thing to do. So getting off your bike, you know, being a pedestrian, that is the safest. But if you are riding on the sidewalk, um, just move very slowly. Um, this little video I'm about to show you, um, you will see what happens to this particular bicyclist. This was a video was taken by a dash cam of a driver on Middlefield in uh, Palo Alto. You see this guy, he's just coasting along. He's got an e-bike, so he can like be zipping along. And he just zipped across that intersection, moving quite fast. But watch what's happening. This, this guy's signaling right here to turn. He's turning right, 
into a, a parking lot. This guy's moving so fast, he crashes into the side. Um, I'm not sure if you saw the uh, speed at which the uh, this person, but you've got the um, miles per hour showing up here. There's 16 miles an hour right here. So you, this, uh, this car, the car is moving 16 to 20 miles an hour. The bicycle is moving at the same speed. That bicyclist should be in this lane or in the bike lane here moving along so that he's with traffic and he's moving. Um, being on a sidewalk is just moving way too fast. And so he, uh, he ends up running into the side of this uh, car. And this is the e-bike too, which is very fast. Okay, let's talk about bicycle facilities. So we've got protected bike lanes, which are very attractive to a lot of people because um, it makes it much harder for a vehicle to like, hit you from behind or you know get into your lane. These flex posts, um, a vehicle can still drive over them, but now we're starting to see hardscape like these little curbs here. So a vehicle doesn't want to damage itself. So it typically won't go over these to uh, get into a, a bicyclist. The so protected bike lanes are great infrastructure, but they can make it more difficult at intersections to get a, um, to maneuver because then the um, car that would have merged into the bike lane to take a right, which would be easier, um, they can't do that. So they have to actually hook across you, um, when, which is called a right hook when a car cuts you off and making a right turn. Um, so in San Jose, at one of their protected intersections, actually, I, I got the right hook thing, a car turned in front of me. I was able to stop in time and maneuver so I didn't hit them. But it's very scary to have a car to sort of cut you off. Um, when you do these protected bike lanes, you have to take the intersections into consideration and have other accommodations to make sure that a bicyclist can't get cut off by a car. And there's some different techniques, but we're getting into a more advanced area. Two-way protected bike lanes can be actually kind of handy. Um, here you're having it on road where you've got uh, this basically parking. You've got these bollards here. Um, you know, here you've also have a driveway. And you this is really kind of, you don't want too many driveways cutting across a two-way lane because then the driver's got to look left and right here. And then they got to look left and right out here, which means that they often can't, then they can't see, once they get out here between the parked cars, they can't see what's happening on the main road. So this is a little bit unusual. Um, but two-way protected bike lanes can be a very safe facility if it's well-designed at intersection to accommodate, you know, how people are crossing it. Um, now, the best two-way protected bike lanes I've seen in the world, actually, I saw in Helsinki, Finland, where it wasn't on the street. They actually had super wide sidewalks that had two-way bike lanes on both sides of um, busy city streets so that um, a bicyclist can get to their destination on either side of the street riding in either direction. Um, and then, but they had long blocks. Um, and then they had um, separate controls for bikes and peds to go across separate from the cars. So they didn't have conflicts for turning. Um, but that's a, a, a area that Silicon Valley could go in. We could have like these super wide sidewalks that are shared with bicyclists. And bicyclists and pedestrians can get along more better than um, cars because bicyclists will not tend to kill a pedestrian. It, it can happen, but it's very rare. Um, and they can talk to each other and mingle. And then if there's a really big pedestrian event, like a march, they can take up a really wide sidewalk and the bicycle can move super slowly. Or if there's a big crowd of bicyclists and there's not very many pedestrians, it's like overflow capabilities to share with the sidewalk as an option. Um, bike boxes, we've talked a little bit about those. We have two styles. You've got the left turn box, which you go straight up in the bike lane, then move left to get in the left turn box. And you've got the turn box. And sometimes um, some facilities have combined the turn bo left turn box with a bike box uh, for um, straight moving cyclists. So here you've got the big green painted box with a, a lead in for cyclists to get into this box, um, getting around cars. Okay, how to get a green light. This is something that stymies a lot of bicyclists. Um, raise your hand if you know how to trigger a, a traffic light with your bicycle. Okay, see one hand going up. You, uh, you raise the digital hand if you have, okay, have two people, okay. So if you see this bicycle symbol on the pavement, get your wheels right on top of it. That's the most sensitive spot where the city actually put a marker for a bicycle to show, put your bike here and our traffic sensors will sense where your bike is and turn the signal for you. Um, there are two styles of traffic or of sensors for vehicles. One um, has uh, a loop or uh, wires in the pavement where it's picking up the metal in a vehicle. Cars are tons of metal. A bicyclists are very little, tiny bit of metal. Um, 
but those uh, metal detectors can still pick up a bicycle if you get on the right location, which these stencils should mark. Alternatively, there could be cameras and poles, and these actually are much more sensitive than typically the, um, the metal detectors. But they still have to be tuned to pick up a bicycle because bicycles are skinny compared to a car, which is this big fat thing on the road. Um, either way, whether there's a, a, in the pavement or there's a camera, be on top of that, that bicycle symbol to make sure that the camera or the metal detector in the road can pick up your bicycle to turn the light for you, especially like with left turn lane and to make a left turn, you want to trigger the signal so it, it turns the arrow for you. But even with a straight through lane, you need to, um, some busy roads you're trying to cross, um, they aren't going to turn the light for, uh, until they sense something needs the uh, light to be turned. So here is what um, those metal detectors look like where nothing is marked. There's no intentional marking. And they, um, the people who make the road, they'll, they'll, after they pave the road, they'll cut into the road to make a groove and they'll lay a wire into it. And then they'll put um, sealant, you know, the asphalt over it and end up with this um, dark area marking it off. And this is what it looked like. Now, um, ideally, um, the city would also paint where you should put your bicycle to set this off. But a lot of times they won't. And so there is a way to set these off um, when you just see this, uh, these etchings in the road. And here are the um, four different styles of etchings you'll typically see in our area. You got the basic rectangle, which we just saw. And the most sensitive area for a bicycle in these cases is on the outer edges in the direction you're going. So put your wheels right on top of the outer edges. That's the most sensitive part for this style of loop detector. If you see a circle, it's also the outer edges, although the circle design turns out to be fairly sensitive across most of the area, but it's still most sensitive right across on top of the wire itself. If you see two um, rectangles side by side and sort of connected in the middle, the most sensitive spot is actually right in the middle on top of this um, center area, which is really handy. Um, and then the most sensitive detector you'll see in this area is called this diagonal double D where you've got these two diagonal parallelogram or trapezoids, I guess. Um, the most sensitive spot for this is right in the middle. You'll end up with one wheel right on top of this piece and one wheel right on top of this piece of this detector. Um, so this design is very sensitive. And that's, this you'll often see like a few of these leading up to the traffic light. And then at the light, you'll see one of these because this is also more sensitive to pick up motorcycles, which are left metal as well, but still a big hunk of metal compared to a bicyclist. Um, so you can get right on top of the middle of this, and that will um, set the light off for you. And if you use these techniques and the light does not turn for you, report it to the city. Ask them to put a stencil of where a bicycle should be, because it'll give signals for bicyclists so they can say, oh, I get on top of the bicycle, the signal goes off. I don't have to understand the physics and the design of these different intersections for uh, metal detectors. Now, the metal detector piece is going away. They're going to traffic cameras for a number of reasons. One, the traffic cameras are more sensitive. Um, and also the traffic cameras don't need to be adjusted and replaced after they repave the road. Like they ripped up, they, when they repave the road, then there, there's no detection there for a while. And they'll put the light on a timer. Those cameras can just sit up on poles and continue to work regardless of what the road surface is. And also um, the pavement gets damaged sometimes. And sometimes these wires get you know, chopped or cut. And so they don't work anymore. Okay, some other facilities you may see in our area. Um, uh, in San, San, San Jose has a few of these. San, Cupertino has a few. I don't know of any in Sunnyvale. I think Palo Alto has some also. You actually, have, whoops, sorry. You'll have left side bike lanes um, where there'll be a one-way street with a just a bike lane uh, for cyclists that can go against what would otherwise be a one-way road legally, which is kind of nice. Uh, so cars can't do that, but bicycles can. That makes it easier for bicycles to get around. Um, a buffer bike lanes I really like because you have the, which you've seen in some of these videos, you've got the bike lane, you've got buffer, uh, hopefully on the parking car side, as well as on the driving car side. So you've got nice spaces to separate you from uh, other cars. Um, raised bike lanes would be putting bike lanes at the same level as a sidewalk, which um, uh, Finland is very popular in Finland and some other parts of uh, the world. Um, in the Netherlands, they actually tend to just build dedicated separate bike facilities. So you've got the car facility, the bike facility, and the pedestrian facility. They're all very distinct. And you're starting to see some of that in Davis in particular, some in Palo Alto, some in Cupertino, where we've got separated um, uh, facilities and our raised facilities. Okay, now we're going to go over some hazards and how to avoid them, getting toward the end of this uh, class here. 
So risky behaviors, again, riding the sidewalks is risky, riding the wrong way against traffic, that's the leading cause for bicycles getting into crashes. Just don't ride against traffic, ride with traffic because you are traffic. I'm ignoring stop signs and traffic signals for people or bikes or in cars. Ignoring this uh, causes a lot of crashes. Don't do that. Um, fail, failing to yield when turning. Um, and primarily, motorists fail to recognize a cyclist. They'll turn left in front of them or right across them. They call left hooks and right hooks. Um, you know, be very vigilant and you know, defensive bicycling. Anticipate what's happening around you before the other people even realize what they're about to do. Um, let's see. Yeah, San Jose is starting to use race bike lanes. And the oh, the bicycle superhighway proposal. Um, we have yet to see what how that'll be implemented. Um, that's still in the concept phase, as it were. And that'll go across um, a large piece of San Jose and into Santa Clara. And um, hopefully it'll be a, a two-way facility with lots of space for bicycles to move it um, as fast as they can and also be able to pass each other comfortably. So we were talking about a wide and fast facility so that bicyclists don't have to um, try to dodge cars when they're passing another bicyclist. Okay, um, more risky behavior. Oh, so let's go over the five layers of safety. First off, control your bike. You have it under control. Don't collide with other people. Um, and control your bike first before you even try signaling. Always control your bike so you don't crash into anything else. Um, obey the law so you don't cause cr crashes. Um, follow the law. Um, so about half of the car bike crashes are caused by cyclists making unsafe decisions. The other half are caused by cars making unsafe decisions. Whoops. Um, so follow the laws, obey signs and signals, uh, you, 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 and signal your turns. Um, position yourself correctly to help reinforce visibility. And so you, you take ownership of the lane that you're in. Um, that will limit motorists' unsafe decisions to try to squeeze you out or, they oh, they just didn't see you. Um, motorists will not run over you intentionally. At least 99.9999% of them won't do that. And the others, whether you're in a bike lane, a side or wherever, if they want to run you over, they'll run you over. So don't worry about that, about the people who intentionally ride, run you over. Worry about the people who wouldn't otherwise run you over, but just didn't see you or didn't realize you were there. Taking the lane will make you very visible. So own that lane. You can avoid almost all crashes by taking the lane. And you'll get a lot of practice doing this during, again, Smart Selecting Part 2, which I highly recommend you follow that, this course up with that second half of uh, that Part 2 course. Okay, avoidance is just um, safe cycling, anticipating what everyone else is doing around you um, so that you don't encounter them. And also there are emergency maneuvers you can use to avoid sticky situations you suddenly find yourself in with very little time to handle. I'll um, be showing you some videos of that, and you'll be learning these and practicing these avoidance techniques in Smart Selecting Part 2. Finally, the last layer of safety is um, like having a seatbelt on, is like your helmet, or um, having gloves also um, if you fall. Um, I'm a big proponent of wearing bike gloves. I just, I'm a commuting and biking all the time. And if I take a little spill, my hand can go out and stop my fall. And I don't have to worry about getting road rash on the palm of my hand by wearing bike gloves. Um, so gloves, helmet. Um, I, I have prescription glasses, but you're wearing sunglasses help protect your eyes from insects and debris flying into your face. Um, so yeah, you can have uh, the safety equipment that you're using. So um, some hazards you can encounter also, um, metal surface joints like ra um, rails or cracks, pavement joints, uh, metal gratings over um, drains, dooring. I just don't ride in the door zone, so I don't have to worry about dooring. So I'm just not there. Um, visibility, depending on when you're riding, you want to um, make sure that you're very visible. If there's rain, you wear something very visible. But like my rain gear is all bright yellow. Um, I, I have a, a safety vest yeah, and throw over my clothing, has reflectors on it. Um, this one actually has branded with SCBC, Bike Coalition in the back. So we give these, um, oops, turn this around. There we go. So here is my safety vest at the back. Whoop. Actually, this turns out to be the same color as my green screen, kind of. There we go. <laughs> so I'm not fading out. There's my safety vest in very bright yellow and green. Okay. Um, actually, I think I've got some pictures. Oh, actually, I haven't. Okay, we'll get to it. Another little pause. Um, let's see, do we have 
Any questions here in the chat? Um, I don't see any questions. It's just some commentary right now. I'm going to keep going so I get through some other things I want to show you. Okay, so we're getting some intermediate topics here. Um, when you're riding with a group of bicyclists, um, like Western Wheelers, Almond Cycle Touring Club, um, how many people here ride with a riding club? Raise your hand. Yep. So um, typically you'll learn these by riding with them and they'll instruct you. And they also have directions you can read before you ride. Um, you use your voice a lot. You talk to the other cyclists around you, tell them you're on your left, um, tell them that there's a whole bump coming up, use your finger to point out issues. Um, people at the back will say car back to give people ahead that there's, hey, there's a car back there. Think about you know where you want to be in the lane, which could mean maintain your space in the lane, or you see an opportunity to have everyone pull off to the right, allow a car to pass. Car up for the person who's in front, letting people in the back know, hey, there's a car up, or maybe there's a car trying to pass another car coming at you, um, which is really important Then get off the road because the, the car driver may be uh, not realizing what's happening. I'm telling other cyclists around you that you're slowing or stopping, just using your words to talk when you're riding with a group. And when you're riding with a group, you want to do things, um, you know, methodically and slowly so you don't suddenly cut off bicyclists off. So you're riding together in a cooperative fashion. Um, you can join a club or you can find a club uh, through the uh, Bike League has the list of all the clubs in the area. Yeah, we've got um, ACT, uh, Alma Cycle Touring Club, ACTC, and Western Wheel are the two biggest clubs. Um, but there's the the, uh, the Fremont Club, there's a couple of Sunnyvale Clubs, Sunnyvale Cupertino, there's some smaller clubs floating around. Um, Multi-use paths are wonderful um, for bikes and pedestrians to share. We've got a lot of great trails in our area, Stevens Creek Trail, Bay Trail, Guadalupe, Coyote, um, Coyote Creek, Los Gatos Creek. Los Gatos Creek is very busy and you have to make sure that you proper practice proper etiquette on these trails. Let's see, do I have a, so um, be courteous, um, yield to pedestrians because they get first priority on the trail. Know the rules of the trail. What's the speed limit? Typically that's 15 miles an hour, which is relatively slow for a fast bicyclist. Um, always give warning, ring your bell. If you've got, I highly recommend you get a bike bell on your bike so you can give a friendly little tinkle to let people know that you're coming up on them and say passing on your left um, or just on your left to give the pedestrians a signal that they hopefully will learn that that means a cyclist is going to pass me on my left. Be very cautious at intersections um, to make sure that cars or pedestrians or the cyclists, you don't collide with them. Um, be predictable, just like you are on a regular auto road. Um, do not use more than half the width of the trail. Um, I have often run into runners or cyclists riding right in the middle of the trail. It's like, do I pass them on the left? Do I pass them on the right? Um, it's very annoying because you don't know which way they're going to go. What do they mean by riding or by, you know, taking up the middle of the trail? Be in your lane on the right side, the, basically the rightmost lane that serves your direction. Um, so you're obviously, you let other people go by you. And then clement weather. Um, I I love rain capes, which is showing rain cape, but I hate this color. It's gray. Just blend into the road. My rain capes are bright yellow. Um a rain cape is the best um, wet weather gear I know of to, for riding on a bicycle. It's like a trim poncho that's designed to fit on you, over you and your bike. Um, I'm hoping I put a picture of me on my rain cape shortly. Um, so riding the rain, I ride in the rain. I've got fenders, I've got my rain, uh, rain gear. Um, I very rarely put on rain pants when I'm riding in the rain, um, unless it's really pouring hard. Um, because my rain cape actually keeps my, um, it's like a little tent over my body. It keeps my legs dry mostly. Um, and then there's, uh, there's, there's cold weather riding and there's riding in the heat. And let's see if they talk about this. Okay, so cold versus hot. So when it's hot, you have the bike clothing, sweats easily, um, it's trim, it lets a little air ventilation around you. When it's cold, you put on a lot of layers and bundle up. Um, again, I don't like these dark colors. I like bright colors so you don't blend into the road. Uh, yeah, here is uh, me with my rain cape on, and it's very trim cut, um, so it forms a little tent over me, and it was raining this day, and um, there's some thumb loops up in front, so you can, um, so the cape is taut over you, and there's a, there's a loop here that, uh, elastic loop that, yeah, I can hook over my saddle, so it stays down my back and doesn't ride up. I've got elastic loops, one for each of my thumbs, so I can hook my thumbs in those, and I can also put them over my brake levers. So it stays as a tent over me. So if I stop, I can take my hands off and it maintains a tent shape over me as I stand and wait. 
And I get a lot of air ventilation under this so that I don't sweat. Because when I put on a full rain jacket and full rain pants, even the Gore-Tex or the breathable layers that are waterproof or breathable, they don't breathe fast enough. And I will sweat a lot and get wet from the inside <laughs> when I'm riding it, unless it's really cold. So if it's super cold and super windy and super rainy, then rain pants and a rain jacket I'll, I'll deal with. But otherwise, most of the time, I'm just putting the rain cape on. And that's my only, and it's very light. It's very small. It packs up into my uh, my bags. Now here you're seeing my um, my commuting bike. This used to be my touring bike. You see, I've got a front rack and a rear rack. And the rear rack, I've got um, metal baskets. In this case, I've got a sign also fixed. Uh, my, my signs currently are not on my bike. Um, they're a little extra weight. I haven't added them back. They replaced my baskets recently. Um, and in my baskets, actually, I'm using some waterproof bags that are free if you have a dog. Um, these are dog food bags turned inside out. They're like 30 pound, they hold 30 pounds of dog food. And they're much more durable. I used to use plastic shopping bags, but those plastic grocery bags, first of all, they don't give them out all, all that often. They're also very thin. My metal baskets would rip through them very quickly. These dog food bags will typically last about a year before they get ripped through because they're really tough. Um, and I just fold them over and put a, a binder clip and then they're waterproof. Um, so they're very handy for carrying my commuting gear, carrying my lunch, carrying my tools. I've got all the stuff I need to repair my bike. And I've got extra clothing in there also, like hats and gloves and other stuff I can throw on. <laughs> um, some other parts you see on my bike, I've got water bottles on my bike so I can stay hydrated. Um, I've got actually, there's here's actually a rear facing video camera here. And I've got also a rear um, light here, this flashing light. On the front, I've got a video camera here as well. And on the other side, it's blocked by the video camera. I've got another flasher that I can turn on for daytime flashing. So I can have a front flashing and a rear flashing light to make myself visible during the day. And then I turn down the flashing and just make them steady at night. So they're just steady lights. So they don't blind people. Um, and actually, you can't see it here, but I've got another big light that's a headlight um, hidden by my um, rain cape here. In this case, I've got rain boots on. Um, they're actually winter riding boots. They're waterproof. So they're like, kind of like a ski boot a cross country ski boot. So it's completely waterproof. Um, you can also get a, a shoe covers um, for shoes if you're riding through a lot of puddles and rain. I've got fenders on my bike because having the water splash up on you, you'll get very wet on the, especially if you're rain cape, you don't want water coming out from underneath you that the tires would throw at your bike and at your body um, when you're riding through puddles. Um, and actually also see, here's my bell right here hidden on my, um, on my stem. And I've got a speaker system here that um, I play music or I get directions, I talks to my phone. And let's see, any other pieces here? Yeah, that's about it. You see, oh, I've got, uh, you see my helmet on. Um, I typically, I sweat a lot. And so I use, you see my bandana, so I've got right here. I roll it up into a, a roll. And this is the best sweatband I've ever found, just a rolled up bandana and I tie it around my head. So it just, you know, on my head, underneath my helmet, it gets flattened out a little bit. Um, but then I can also use it in my washcloth um, or I can use it as a, a towel. You know, if I wring it out and then it, I use it as a towel, I can use it as my napkin and I can use it as a handkerchief. So a bandana, super useful as a bicyclist. Um, nighttime riding, um, lights front and rear, white in the front, red in the rear. Reflectors are really important. These vests, you notice this vest just is very visible when you've got this big reflective area, it makes you super visible at night as well as during the day. So I highly recommend a vest. You just want to be as visible as possible. And when I am riding at night, I'm actually more visible at night than I am during the day because I've got lights front and on my side and the back, the lights all over, I've got reflectors all over. So when a car, is, it, they can obviously see me wherever I am at night, um, even better than during the day. Oh yes, April, yeah, Cleverhood is one of the few places that sells um, good capes still, rain capes. Um, okay, rural riding. So this you'll be, um, won't see as much in our area, although you will see it if you ride up into the mountain or if you go down into Gilroy or Morgan Hill in the farming areas or Napa Valley is a great place. It has a lot of rural riding, a lot of fun riding up there. Um, you've got narrower roads. And when you're riding in a rural area, so in an urban area, definitely fully take the lane. In a rural area, um, you may or may not have a shoulder. So if you have a shoulder, you can ride on the shoulder. But if you have no shoulder, um, 
you can sort of pay attention to what, how the cars are behaving around. If they're really polite cars, then you can ride more on the right side, make it less hard for cars to pass you. But if the cars are being obnoxious, take the lane. And I've taken the lane even on a road with a 70 mile an hour speed limit through Texas because there was no shoulder. And I wanted to make sure that all the cars saw me. Um, and luckily it was a fairly straight, very good visibility. And there was not much traffic. So they, it should be easy to pass me. Watch for oncoming traffic. One of the scariest situations you can be in is you're, you're on the road and you see a car passing another car on these little rural roads that, you know, they're on the other lane. They're coming at you fast. In that case, um, you'll see them and you'll just ditch off the side on your bike just to make sure that they don't run you over. They should have been watching, um, you know, to see oncoming traffic, look for bikes as well. As, and that's why I show why flashing lights are really good because it'll pick up their attention and say, oh, something's coming. I don't know how far away it is. I won't try passing. But um, that's a very scary situation to be in on a rural road where another one car is passing another car coming at you. Um, wind blasts are more of an issue, which you don't typically encounter in a city situation where you've got high speed truck traffic passing you. Um, and they have a big wind envelope around you because they're going like, you know, 65 miles an hour. And this is, and you'll feel this wind push you away from the car on the truck when they pass you. But that, after they pass you, there'll be another gust of wind that'll suck you in behind the truck. Um, and you have to be prepared for that and steer the way, sort of counter steer against that to maintain a straight line of travel and just be anticipating when the wind is blowing you one way or another. Um, and figure out how to be polite on a rural road. Um, so rural roads are great because there's usually a lot less traffic. You got a lot more nature. You can hear what's around you. You don't have all this traffic noise. It's very nice. Another review and questions. Um, I'm gonna keep going. Okay, so an advanced topics, the final stretch here, hopefully. Um, when you're riding long distances, either with a club or if you're bicycle touring, it's really nice to get a break from the wind. And it's called drafting or riding a pace line so that the person ahead of you takes the brunt of the wind and the person riding behind can follow in the slipstream and use a lot less effort and a lot less energy to stay up with whoever's riding in front of them. There's a whole protocol for um, drafting and pace lining the right way where you all share a load in the front. Um, join a club to learn how to do that effectively. You're riding really close to the person in front of you. Your, your front wheel is often just a few inches away from the rear wheel of the person in front of you. Very important not to have your front wheel overlap with their rear wheel, because if your wheels cross and they make a turn and your front wheel touches their rear wheel, they won't notice. But you in the back, you have your steering affected and it'll knock you over. And a lot of people fall that way when they get too close to the person ahead of them. Um, also, you'll get very practiced at shifting and anticipating your shifts before you go up big mountains so that you don't stall out and get stuck trying to climb and descending also going down to big mountains um, and knowing how to descend safely is important. I'm not going to cover it here. Um, a ride with a club or um, let's see. Um, there's a, a savvy psych and Lori Lee Lowen offers actually descending and climbing classes. I think Western Wheelers has uh, contracted with her to offer some more advanced riding courses. Um, we're, we're mainly focused on traffic safety and handling ourselves in more urban areas or just around being traffic with the more advanced techniques for riding more efficiently. Um, Lori has some great classes or you can just learn it just by going on Western Wheelers or ACTC rides. Oh, and by the way, um, bicycle touring is one of my favorite activities. I think it's the best way to see the world because unlike flying or driving, you're not insulated from the world around you. You are in the world. You're experiencing the weather, the terrain, how hot or cold it is. You get to talk to people and say hi to them while you're going by them. Uh, you meet people, people have questions for you. It's a lot of fun um, just encountering people and um, enjoying the people you meet. And also if you bike tour, there's a lot of free lodging worldwide through an organization called warmshowers.org. So it's very economical, not just because you're not burning fossil fuel and using a lot of stuff, but you can get free lodging and often free food at a lot of these places. Uh, warmshowers.org, great organization. I host bicyclists from around the world. Um, and last time I biked across the country, I stayed um, at 34 strangers' houses that I met through Warm Showers. So out of my 90 days of crossing, a third of them were with um, people that I had never met before. I just stayed with them and had a great time. I'd cook for them or they'd cook for me. I got to meet them. They showed me the community. Several of them threw dinner parties for me, invited all their friends over and had a party. It was really fun. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm not going to go further into hills and climbing, descending. Uh, 
there's lots of different techniques for doing that. I will say um, when you're turning, always have your outside pedal down. So uh, your inside pedal will be up when you're making a like you're making a left turn, have your left pedal up so that you don't clip the pedal when you're making it like you're descending a, a mountain. Um, and it also makes your bike more stable to have your outside pedal down, uh, the outside pedal of the turn that you're making. Limited access highways. Um, going across country, you'll be faced with these. Um, so in Wyoming, New Mexico, California, Texas, Arizona, I've had to ride on highways that otherwise you wouldn't think bicyclists would be on. Um, in in the Cal most areas of California, limited access highways or freeways where they have um, on ramps and off ramps. Um, you usually don't think of bicyclists on those roads, but when there are no other roads in the area and that's the only road going through an area, it is legal for bicyclists to go on those roads. Um, again, in parts of California, large parts of Wyoming, Arizona, New Mexico, and some parts of Texas, and some other places, uh, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, there's other states also, that where there just are no other roads to get to there. So you'll need to ride in limited access highways. Those highways, um, the way they're designed, um, they're actually pretty safe for bicyclists to be on because they've got monstrously wide shoulders where they're meant to be able to pull a truck off on the side and have it stay away from traffic in case it breaks down. Um, so those lanes are really great. They tend to be a little rougher sometimes um, than the smoother road. And they also tend to have a lot of garbage pile up on them or other debris, which is annoying, especially because um, these trucks, these big trucks will be driving along and they'll just let their tires disintegrate. And there's a lot of little wires in tires. And when the tires disintegrate, they get these really short, sharp wires that are littering the sides of limited access highways. And when I was biking across the country in 2019, um, five of my six flats were from those little short wires on the sides of these you know, highways. Um, very annoying because almost nothing will protect you from the wires other than not riding where they are. So, but riding on the road itself, you've got a lot of space. It's annoying because the, the vehicles are very loud, but they're quite far from you. Um, and the wind blasts are quite far from you all because they're not passing you that close. You're on the, the side of the road, of the big wide road. But if you are, um, sometimes can, the shoulders can get a little narrow. You might get large, closer to large trucks, which you can run into wind blasts there also. Um, going across West Virginia, um, there was actually a spot. They had no other roads um, they, right there. Um, so I actually took, uh, I was on a limited access highway going across some mountains there. Um, and then they started doing construction on this road. And they narrowed it down to one lane. And I actually, I took the full lane and was right in the middle of it and was happy to have a, a cooperative truck driver behind me blocking all the tra traffic. So the traffic behind me couldn't see why they were going so slow. And there I was for three or four miles on this only lane that was available on this limited access highway, keeping up all the traffic behind me, but there's no place to pull off. And it was just one lane wide. Um, and for the person who joined late, um, actually, you've got a couple of options. You, there is a, um, a computer-based training version of this, which if you, at the sign up for this on the Eventbrite or on our webpage, or, uh, um, you can actually take this training, the smart cycling like part one, as a computer-based training, League of American Bicyclists. I also be, will send out a link for everyone who attended um, here tonight um, to the recording that I'm currently making of this presentation. So you can... Um, Rewatch this presentation if you so wish. Okay. Um, also, limited access highways do know your state law. Um, you know, know where it is legal to ride on the highway. Um, we have one small section here in California, 280. There's a little section of 280 that you can ride your bike on, um, but there's a very short section up um, in San Mateo County toward San Francisco. Um, in Southern California, heading into Arizona, there's some uh, long sections where the, that's the only road. Um, let's see, right in the shoulder, and just know your state laws. You're going across country. Um, okay, so I use my bike um, to move everything everywhere. So here is one of my smaller cargo trailers. This is my four foot cargo trailer. I uh, set up and take down these uh, banners for AYSO in Sunnyvale, and so I see the banners stacked in the back, and I'm pulling it behind in this trailer. Um, here's a longer rig setup where I've got four trailers. I've got. Um, the Surly um, Bill trailer, which is a very strong trailer. It's a six foot trailer. It's pulled by a Bikes at Work eight foot trailer, which is my favorite cargo trailer. It can haul a lot of stuff and it's, it's pretty wide so I can put a sofa on it or other wide stuff. And I can carry plywood in this. It's eight foot wide so I can just lay the plywood on top and carry it. Um, here's again my four foot cargo trailer and here's my three foot 
smallest trailer that used to be my kid's trailer turned into a, uh, you know, a covered cargo trailer. I kind of throw things into it, just pull down the, the rain flap so I can keep stuff rainproof. And um, yeah, so I was getting prepared to haul a lot of stuff with this trailer setup. And uh, see, here's the stuff I was hauling. I was picking up 12 bikes. So how many of your cars can fit 12 bikes? <laughs> I'm pulling them all with my bike. So I was picking up bikes to bring to the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition. And so I've got bikes loaded up on all these trailers. And then um, they gave me a bunch of helmets and locks, which I tossed into this final um, trailer. So I've got a lot of cargo here. And here I, I made it to the Bike Coalition. Um, this is their office in San Jose. So I was pulling into the back patio we have, all the bikes. And that was like a... It took me uh, it was like 15 mile ride to get to where I picked up the bikes. It was only a four mile ride to get from where I picked up the bikes to our bike coalition headquarters. Um, but I, I've hauled, um, I filled all four of those trails and haul stuff for up to about 20 miles each direction. When I was doing some courses, I'd bring everything for the course. And in fact, if you come to our course, I typically bring all the gear we need to run the course by bike to the course for part two. And so I can haul up to like four canopies and four tables and lots of chairs and literature and stuff. Um, my max load is about 650 pounds of cargo, which makes me about half a ton when I, about a thousand pounds when you include my weight and the bike weight and the trailer weight and the cargo weights, all of it combined. And that's about as much as I can deal with. And with that much weight, I can go over small rises. I can't, with the, that much weight, I can't go over an overpass. Um, with about 450 pounds to 500 pounds of cargo, I still make it over an overpass. Um, so that's about 800 pounds total weight with everything combined. Um, but 1,000 pounds, I can't even go over an overpass. And whatever I can get up and over, I can also stop with my brakes on my bike. So that's kind of a key thing is I don't go over anything. I can't climb up on my own power. Okay, some avoidance maneuvers. Um, we've got, This will be learned in Smart Slack in part two. We've got the rock dodge. Avoidance weave is not that useful, but rock dodge is super useful. I use that a lot. Quick stop and instant turn. Use those less, but they're still useful. Um, with a rock dodge, you have a rock right in front of you. And the idea is to get your bike around it without your front wheel hitting that rock. Because if the front wheel hits a rock, it'll completely destabilize you and cause a fall. And that happens to a lot of cyclists. Or it could be a pothole. You're trying to get your front wheel around it. And if your rear wheel hits it, not usually a biggie because you're, you're at this, you know, it's a bump, but it won't cause you to fall. And what you'll do is you'll flick your steering to the left or the right, depending on what your pattern is. I usually do go to the left. And then um, that will, your bike will sort of tilt a little bit, but then right as you get past that, you'll flick back to the right and you'll end up straightening your bike out. So your front wheel will have missed it. Your body ends up going basically the straight line over the rock, but your bicycle will end up swerving around the obstacle in front of you. And then you'll have missed the rock and then you straighten out. And I've got a video coming up showing this. Hazards can spring up before you know it. A properly executed rock dodge will allow you to avoid an obstacle and maintain your steady road position. Being able to respond to a surprise in your path without veering into the path of another road user can avoid a crash, especially in the narrow confines of urban riding. First, look and concentrate at the hazard you want to avoid. You will ride straight towards it, moving the bike around it at last opportunity. The priority is to clear the object with your front wheel because that is where you depend on all of your control. If you strike the object with your rear wheel, you'll still be able to maintain steering. Watching the road and knowing how to respond to hazards will lead to a less rocky ride. So you'll practice that at Smart Cycling Part 2. Now, during our practice, you'll be focused on seeing that thing well in advance and, and schooling yourself not to slowly avoid it because you want to test that rock dodge. What happens in the wild when you actually use this is you'll be riding along, you'll suddenly at the last minute notice, oh no, there's a rock right there. And then you'll be able to dodge around it um, or a pothole. So it's very handy. Hazards can. Okay. Um, the avoidance weave is just um, being able to maneuver your bike around lots of rocks or um, glass. And you can actually sort of swoop around them and just sort of weave your way through an obstacle course. Um, we may or may not get this covered in our Smart Cycling Part 2 because it's not it's not quite as useful. You tend not to run into that many situations where you, this is that hard to just do. And um, But it is a good practice for if you do this, if we have time for it, this leads into the next thing that um, I, that we'll get to that we'll be doing. 
Um, I'm, before I get to the final two, instant stop and the quick turn, I'm going to show you some common crashes. This is actually from the bicycle drive, um, the course that we te teach for drivers to be safe from bicyclists. But I include this video here because it shows you the situations that these next two techniques help you avoid. Knowing the most common types of crashes between drivers and cyclists is the first step to avoiding them. Being a safe driver means driving cautiously. The four most common types of crashes that occur between drivers and people on bikes are the left hook, the right hook, overtaking, and dooring. Let's discuss these common crashes and discuss simple ways to avoid them. In the left hook, a driver fails to yield to an oncoming cyclist as the driver turns left through an intersection. Often, the left hook is the result of a failure by the driver to actively see the person on a bike who is clearly visible. Or, the driver underestimates the speed of the cyclist and turns left without giving the cyclist enough space. People on bikes can often be traveling at the same speed as motorized traffic. Do not assume a person on a bike is traveling slow. A driver can avoid a left hook crash by slowing down, yielding to oncoming traffic, using a turn signal, scanning the entire intersection, and waiting until it is safe to proceed. The right hook is when a driver passes a person biking in the same direction as them and then turns right into the path of the person on a bike. A driver can avoid the right hook crash by slowing down and staying behind the person biking. Drivers often misjudge the speed of cyclists, which can lead to serious crashes. A driver can avoid the right hook crash by using your right turn signal, checking your rear view and side mirrors, and turning your head to check blind spots. It is always safer to stay behind a bicyclist and wait until they pass through the intersection to execute your right turn. One of the deadliest crashes for people biking is when a driver overtakes them. An overtaking crash is when a driver attempts to pass a person biking and does not leave enough room between the car and the person on a bike. By passing a person on a bike too closely, the driver may startle them, or worse, the driver may hit the person and cause a serious crash. Keep in mind that in most states, drivers are allowed to cross over a double yellow line in order to safely pass a bicyclist when there is no oncoming traffic. A driver can avoid an overtaking crash, which could kill someone, by slowing down and waiting until it is safe to pass, putting a car's width of space between you and the person on a bike, and only passing when the road ahead and oncoming traffic is clear so that you may give the person on a bike at least 5 feet of space. Finally, dooring is another easily avoidable crash. Dooring is a term to describe a driver or passenger opening their car door into the path of an oncoming person biking. The consequences can be severe, either hitting the person on a bike or causing them to swerve into traffic behind them. Before opening your car door, look over your shoulder closest to the door and check your rear view and side mirror to make sure there aren't people on bikes, scooters, or other vehicles coming up behind you. Open your door slowly with caution. As a driver, it is your responsibility to make sure it is clear before opening your door. Thanks for sharing the road. So these common crashes, um, I don't trust other drivers to remember how to open their door. I just don't ride in the door zone. You notice that woman who is riding, she was actually taking the lane and saying, well, clear of the door zone, just owning the lane. So these next two um, techniques, the instant stop and the quick turn, um, help you with the right hook and left hook and dooring situation. And April, you have a question. Yes, I'm just going to jump in. I'm really surprised that um, uh, Lab isn't um, pushing the Dutch reach for the um, door video. The reason they're not pushing it is you've got millions and millions of drivers to retrain, and that's just a, an insurmountable obstacle. And you don't want to rely on them learning the Dutch reach. Um, so they're they're already reminding you of all the techniques you should do in this training. Um, but it's just not part of our culture, and it'll be really hard lift to get it to be part of our culture. So it's um, it's just better to not ride in the dark door zone. That way you are in control of your own safety, not relying on someone else Remember no, I, the right thing. I, I completely agree with you in terms of keeping that distance, but and this is a driver video and I'm surprised they're not starting. I have heard it elsewhere um, being pushed um, as driver education and they're essentially having them in that video, you know, you're, you're looking out your rear view, you're, you're turning and it, they did sort of show the woman reaching with her right arm to open the door, but it, it would be useful if they 
started using the same language and you know it's just having that sort of educational campaign for folks yeah <laughs> so yeah they aren't at this time um that might change i have had um an adverse reaction for a lot of people in saying anything about europe <laughs> there's a you know they're different from us um is another reaction i've run into from some uh some people <laughs> that's even from state to state when you talk about the idaho stop so yeah that doesn't surprise yeah. me yeah, I, I hope that California passes the Idaho stop. We can talk more about it in the Q&A yeah. afterwards. That will actually be very effective at reducing injuries for bicyclists. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so um, so with dooring and with left hooks and right hooks, there's um, a couple of ways to stop yourself or avoid those if they happen in front of you. Knowing the um, so one is a quick stop. It's basically stopping as fast as possible, and but under control in a very, very short distance. You don't crash into whatever the thing is that would otherwise pop out in front of you. It's using both your front and rear brakes um, as combined. It's also sliding your body back in the saddle and getting it as low as possible. Your center of gravity is low and as far back as possible, so you can't flip over the handlebars when you slip, you brake really hard. Um, and you're you're. When you're braking with both hands really hard, if you feel yourself, if you, well, this is it's really, you've got to experience, it's hard to describe, but if your rear wheel starts skidding, you actually, um, you, you don't release the front brake, you actually release, or you actually release the front brake, not the rear brake, to stop the skidding happening in the rear brake. Because what's happening is when you squeeze both brakes and your rear wheel starts to skid, the weight is coming off of your rear wheel and that means you're starting to rotate over your front wheel. So you actually want to release your left brake, which is your front brake, a little bit so that it lets more weight settle on the rear, which will stop the skid and also stop you from flipping over. So I've got a, a video on that here so you can watch it for the quick stop. When riding your bike, you can expect to encounter obstacles or other surprises from time to time. Proper braking will prevent this. The quick stop will allow you to safely stop your bike to avoid an obstacle without losing control. For a fast straight stop, use both brakes. If the rear wheel starts to skid, ease up on the front brake. Braking always causes weight to shift forward. Counter that by shifting your weight back. Use your arms to push the bike out in front of you. Keep the handlebars straight and do not try to turn. By practicing this move, you'll be prepared to perform it smoothly when need arises. The quick stop could prevent you or someone else from serious harm. Oops. Yeah, so we'll, we'll practice this. And so like if someone did a, a left hook in front of you or right hook or a door popped open and someone jumped in front of you, you could possibly execute a quick stop to prevent yourself from crashing into them. And then the other option you have, particularly with a right hook, where you get very, very little advanced notice and it's like right in front of you, the instant turn is actually a really good way um, to avoid the right hook crash. Um, where there's, It's actually faster at changing where you are than a quick stop. You actually will turn you, and you've, you've got to build up the new habit here because it's a little bit counterintuitive, but it's actually how it works. And if you're a motorcycle, any of you ride motorcycles? Nope. Um, this is actually how you will turn. Hey, I got one person. Um, you, this is how you can turn a motorcycle. Um, a motorcycle is really heavy and you counter steer. So you actually turn away from the direction you want to turn to get your, your motorcycle, your bicycle to lean in the direction you need to turn. So you can quickly turn your wheel the other way and then catch yourself and actually make a much faster turn, intentional turn um, away from something or, you know, or in the direction you want to go. So in this case, if you're doing having a right hook happen, you'll actually turn your uh, your wheel toward the vehicle that you're about to hit that will lean you away from that vehicle. And then you'll turn it in the other direction to catch yourself from falling over to the right. And you end up executing a very, very, very fast right turn. So you'll, you'll flick to the left, you'll lean to the right, and then you'll turn to the right to catch yourself. It feels unnatural, it requires practice, but if you do want to ride a motorcycle someday, this is actually a good way to, uh, to initiate a turn on a motorcycle. And, and, and that, Natalia, I see your hand still up. Do you have an additional question or you just had that? Okay, up for the motorcycle. Okay, so I've got a video now for this. 
Um, and again, we'll, we'll learn and practice this um, at Smart Selecting Part 2. Actually, is a slow-mo. So he, he flicked to the left, causes his bike to lean to the right, and now he's turning his, vehicle, his uh, wheel to the right and catching himself and able to execute a really tight turn going at a, this is a slow-mo. They're going actually quite fast toward this and going to the right. So um, let me play that one more time. You're coming at this, and then we're going to slow-mo mode. You see the flick to the left, it causes the bike to lean to the right, and then he turns around and he turns to the right. And also notice that his inside pedal is up, his outside pedal is down, because it's a very sharp turn. And if the inside pedal was down, you could catch that pedal, and it would, that, would, that would cause a fall. So always, uh, when turning, have your outside pedal down, like when you're descending a mountain also, the same, the same kind of technique as we carve around. And when you do this um, right, you can do this at quite high speeds and you'll hear the tire carving into the asphalt when you're doing this. Um, I would only do this where um, you've got good asphalt. Like if you're on a sandy surface, you'd wipe out as <laughs> your tire would skid out from under you. Um, so you want, do wanna pay attention to the kind of surface you're on because this won't work well if it's um, sandy. Um, yeah. Versus actually the rock dodge, by the way, um, mountain bikers will also do the rock dodge, even a sandy or rocky surface to avoid a rock that they need to avoid. Because in that case, your body is continuing straight and the, the bike doesn't need quite as much traction. But for the um, instant turn, you need really, really good traction for your front tire to grip into. Okay, um, wrapping up. So some smart cycling resources, there's a lot of online videos. We got the quick guide tips. We've got the uh, smart cycling manual and go bikeleague.org slash ride smart to get some of these LED videos. Um, they got a connect locally map, community and state report cards. Um, they got a bunch of advocate tools on the bikeleague.org site. Uh, Silicon Valley Bike Coalition, we've got a lot of resources for you on our website. Go to bikesiliconvalley.org. We've got a lot of safety tips on um, bikesiliconvalley.org slash resources slash getting started. Um, we've got um, our education page, which is bikesiliconvalley.org slash ed, where you can sign up to take part two. So if you haven't signed up to take part two, sign up now, because I think um, it will close off being able to register after tonight, if you want to take the one that's happening, or maybe maybe tomorrow, you maybe have one, one right day. But um, we cut off uh, um, sign ups a little bit in advance, so we know how many instructors we need to have there. June 4th is our next part two class is on uh, this coming Sunday. It's at the um, Berryessa BART station. So you can take public transit there, or you can bike there, or you can drive there, lots of parking. You'll um, see us at the surface lot that is um, across from the VTA transit area. So you don't go into the parking garage, but you will you should, um, if we get a lot of people, we'll set up a canopy. But if we have just a few people, just look for some bikes and cones set up. And Nancy, you've got, got, a, got a question. Yeah, do you know when the next part two Class will Look be. on the website, okay. bikes.org slash ed. It's got our full okay. schedule there. So you can't make this one go for the following one. Um, it is a prereq that you take part one before you take part two. Because we need to walk, talk, talk you through all this stuff before you actually go to do everything. So at least they have had been exposed to it once before we actually do it all on our bikes. Um, you can take this course online. If you go to bikes.org slash ed, in either the part one or the part two, it'll say how to take part one online, totally online, uh, in a computer-based training mode that from the uh, bikeleague.org site. Um, that's better than watching the video because it's a little more interactive. You have to answer questions. You can also take the um, exam in advance on your own time online. Um, and that's one of the modules if you want to do the, the, the written exam that way. Note that the online written exam is more challenging than the paper written exam that we'll give. Um, but we've covered all the material in this course and then um, then you can flip through and refresh yourself also using the manual, which you'll get a copy of at the training. Um, yeah, and so um, take all these courses and together we can make Silicon Valley a better place to ride our bikes and save the world all at the same time and have fun. Okay, now we got questions. Actually, I'm gonna turn off the slideshow so we can just all see each other. So uh, pop your question into the chat or raise your hand. Yes, Jay Jordan. Um, I've got a couple questions. Uh, first one is related to the instant turn. Um, so I guess how, like in what, 
to who would you recommend actually like considering doing that technique? Because you, when you introduced it, you said like, oh, if, if quick stop is too slow for you, then do the instant turn because it's even faster. Um, but it, it sounded like there's a lot of like decisions that you have to make in that split second. Like, is the road good enough? And then rotating the uh, pedals in the right way. It seems like too many things to, to do in your head in that quick moment. Yeah, with these last two, the instant stop and the quick turn, um, you need to practice them enough so that you can do it out of just a reaction, habit, instinct, without having to think about it. So usually you'll be on, you'll know the road surface in advance because you'll be on a paved road. You say, okay, you know, versus on like a mountain biking trail or a place with less sand or gravel. Um, and these techniques, um, unfortunately, you're not likely to use them very often. So you won't practice them very much. So you won't, generally won't be ready to do them. So doing everything else we're teaching is part of Smart Cycling Part 2 and is part of the Smart Cycling Series of um, being a... Uh, um, aware of your surroundings and being defense, practice defensive bicycling and maintaining road position and following the traffic laws. Ideally, you'll never be put in the position if you do everything right of even needing to use the instant stop or quick turn. Um, but these techniques, um, it is possible to learn them, to execute them, but it does take a lot of practice and practice and practice and building up uh, a habit for it. And in our smart cycling class, you learn it and hopefully you'll get to execute it somewhat correctly. Um, in order to take past the LCI uh, the instructor exam or the uh, seminar, which is like three days of training, you have to execute these perfectly there. But um, I, I've, I've got uh, over 130,000 miles of biking and um, I've really, actually I've only used, had to use the instant turn exactly once. And that was actually fairly recently when I was in a protected bike lane in San Jose where um, I got I got right hooked and I did it by instinct, but um, I had never had to use that before ever. So I'm trying never to put my position ever using them. But if you are put in the position, um, it's a useful technique, but it takes a lot of practice. Um, and the instant stop, uh, I haven't used that. That I mean, I've, I've stopped quickly, but again, I've tried never to put myself in those positions because that also relies on having a good road surface because you can't stop really fast if it's sandy or it's slick or it's snowy, it's icy. It's just not going to work. Um, so there's limited situations where those work, but they actually teach you some good principles you can use just in handling your bike in general. So we continue to teach them. Um, they're actually part of the original set of uh, courses that Lee American Bicycles put together where the first person who put those together, John Forrester, um, he, he called it effective cycling. And he was a former racer. Yeah, he lived in Sunnyvale and Palo Alto. He lived in the um, Silicon Valley area. And uh, he actually had a, um, this smart cycling course you're taking now, he used to have, this is a three-day course, really, <laughs> a lot of material. We've shaved it down more to day-ish time. And we've stripped a lot of stuff off of it to make it just the, uh, the traffic safety pieces. These parts have, are still in there. In a future course, I could see the instant stop and quick turn maybe being dropped off because they're so rarely used and you really have to practice them a lot to get them down to where you're going to be using them. So this, this is a last ditch way to hopefully not have yourself die, but you shouldn't ever be put in that position well in advance just by having great infrastructure, having well-trained bicycles and drivers, following the law, making yourself visible, predictable, riding straight lines, and just not ever getting to that spot. So... Yeah. Um, and then I had questions about um, interactions with law enforcement. Um, so I've, I've had multiple encounters where it seemed pretty clear that law enforcement did not actually know what the laws were regarding bicyclists. Um, I had an interaction uh, at the end of one of the Viva Calles where they were reopening the roads to cars and they were yelling at people over their megaphones, you know, get out of the street, go on the sidewalk or the bike lane um, on a road that didn't have a bike lane. Um, and then a couple of weeks ago at uh, San Jose Bike Party, we were making a left hand turn. So we were all in the left hand lane and they yelled at us at the megaphone, get in the bike lane, you know you can't make a left turn from a bike lane. So, so I guess two questions, like 
um, one, like does Silicon Valley by coalition, like talk to the local law enforcement agencies to try and like teach them what the law is regarding cycling. Um, and like, if you are, you know, say pulled over by law enforcement who doesn't know what the rules are, do you have suggestions for like, you know, how to deal with that? Okay, I've got many suggestions. First of all, we do um, have conversations with public safety departments and police departments on a regular basis. And you are correct that a lot of police officers really don't know the law that well around bicycling, unless they're bicycles themselves. We really like to see um, uh, police on bicycles, and hopefully they've taken at that point some real bicycle safety training. Um, there are some lead cycling instructors specialized in teaching um, police departments how to ride bicycles safely and correctly. And they actually take the smart cycling course or version of it. Um, that covers all the same material. So they actually know how bicycles are supposed to behave on the road and they learn the laws. But a lot of police don't ride bicycles, they only drive and have the, the driver mentality. And a lot of drivers don't understand how bikes work either. So um, some things we're working on or different people working on, we'd like to see um, bicycle education started in elementary, middle and high school as part of a required piece of um, physical education so that all drivers before they get the driver's license basically have taken and learned everything you're learning as far as smart cycling part one and two. So they know how bicycles are supposed to be on roads before they learn how to be a driver. So it makes them a much safer driver. This is a situation that Europe has. So they're setting up a culture and, and designing, engineering their education so that all everyone, everyone across the whole board are properly trained to be better bicyclists and drivers. Now, when confronting a police officer, um, you need to be respectful of them because some of them are trigger happy. You don't know how, what <laughs> direction they're going or how they'll interpret stuff. Um, a follow up with them afterwards when, you know, cooler heads can prevail and you can send them an email or make sure and uh, get, record information, you know, get their badge number, get their name. They can get take your name you can exchange information. Um, uh, take pictures of as much stuff as you can um, to record stuff. I've got video cameras running a lot of the time recording what I'm doing. Uh, uh, for this purpose, if I'm encountering um, police or vehicle drivers that are doing the wrong thing, I can report them afterwards and follow up. And sometimes when I'm doing the follow up, sometimes the police departments um, know the law and say, oh, yeah, that's wrong. Yeah, we'll follow up. And sometimes they can't be bothered with helping a cyclist and preventing future crashes because they only want to worry about people who actually died because they've got to worry about serious stuff when they die. And then they'll take, uh, take action. But if they haven't died, then, well, no harm, no foul kind of thing. But they're not into the prevention side of it as much, which is very frustrating for me as a cyclist because I really want to prevent these crashes and get everyone educated before it happens. Um, so the um, the best action I've found is some police departments um, have sent a letter to they we've got uh, we've seen the driver we've seen the vehicle they send a letter to the owner of the vehicle saying hey we saw this behavior it's not acceptable you have to give bicyclists in particular three minimum of three feet clearance. Five feet's better, five or six feet's much better with a, a big vehicle, but three feet minimum. And I've got videos of, of cars passing me much too close or abusing me um, by doing abusive passes or coal rolling, which is really terrible and illegal, where um, like a pickup truck, in particular diesel trucks, will um, pass you, slow down in front of you so that you're really close and stomp on the uh, their diesel pedal, which will create a big cloud of black smoke in front of you, which is really bad. Um, and actually, Santa Clara um, police, I ran into some police where I reported a situation there where someone was abusive in a special traffic safety protection zone. They actually went out and visited the car driver and talked to the parents that owned the car. But the, both the, the younger man who was driving the car um, and the parents said they, would, they refused to listen to police officers telling them, no, you can't pass them in that closely. You've got to give them space. <laughs> Even the parents couldn't be convinced, even by the police officers talking to them, because the police officer called me back afterwards and told me what the interaction was like. Oh, man. So that was a that was a great, actually, interaction with the police. But I've had other police just completely ignore me. Um, I have had really good interactions with um, FedEx trucks that passed me unsafely. I called the FedEx people, and they were very apologetic. I had the numbers of the trucks, and they were following up with the truck drivers to make sure that they gave cyclists very wide berth because they got big trucks. Um, so... It's hard, and it's a constant. Uh, you know, the the best thing would be have this instantiated in our education system, so all drivers become very well educated as bicyclists before they become drivers. 
uh, or car drivers least. So it can be bicycle drivers first. And then I think that will be the best long-term solution and um, better infrastructure. So we've got a safe place for all of us to be. That helps reinforce good behavior. Um, education can only handle so much. Um, by um, If you're into product design, which I, I did 35 years in product design, high tech, you need to design stuff. So you don't need documentation. So it's just obvious how things work and you naturally keep things so that things just work better. Um, and we'll get better designs like they find in Europe, hopefully get more of those in the United States. Um, there's a really good book called The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. Read that book if you want to learn more about design. It's, um, we need to think about our traffic uh, um, facilities the same way. Uh, uh, I have a question. Yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Is it legal to basically bike on walkway footpath? In case there is no biking lane and I'm we, safe um, on bike. Yeah, you missed that part. Yeah, we it, it is. Oh, well, it depends on the city. So you need to pay attention to your local laws. But if you ride on the sidewalk, be at a pedestrian speed, and then you'll be fine. Um, but pay attention to whatever the laws are in your city and yield to pedestrians. So pedestrians have the right of way on a sidewalk. Um, there are some situations that even I, as an experienced cyclist, have decided to ride briefly on the sidewalk because that was the safest option. Um, but uh, I have a second question. Uh, on Lawrence or uh, St. Thomas Expressway, it's mostly that there is a biking lane, biker's lane, but mm -hmm. some section there is no biker's lane, but, but there is enough room on the shoulder to bike. Is it legal to do that? It is legal on the expressways to bike on the shoulder. Um, the expressways are one of our biggest opportunities to improve our facilities. Um, the county is interested in making sure there really there are good bike facilities on our expressways. Um, we're not seeing that happen quite yet. We still need a lot more um, political will and muscle and money to, you know, get that to happen. <clears throat> so it's very important for all of you who are on this um, to talk to your city officials and get um, your the staff to know you that you're interested in making um, bicycling safer and get your council members. You should know all the council members for whatever town you're in, um, and know the people who are on the bike ped commissions there also. And if you haven't yet serve on the bike ped commission. I've been on the bike commission three different terms now. I'm on, um, I was on it in the 90s, and then I, I'm on it now. I'll be um, terming out after an eight-year stint on the Sunnyvale Bike Ped Commission. I've also served on the Caltrans District 4 Bike uh, Committee, which April, who's on this call, is currently our, the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition representative to the Caltrans District 4 representative for that um, state-level commission for the district for the nine-county Bay Area. And then I've been on the uh, county, Santa Clara County Bike uh, Ped Commission also. Um, so there's lots of opportunities for you to get involved with local government. Um, your local government has a bigger impact in our quality of life than any other governments we interact with. And you can get to know your council members or run for council yourself and then make be in the position to be able to make those decisions and direct staff to do it this way or that way. Um, but definitely get to at least know your representatives. So I know my local city representatives and in, in Everyone is Sunnyvale, a lot of them in Cupertino, some of them in Sunnyvale, some of them in Mountain View. Um, and I know my state representatives, um, both my senator and my um, representative, or my, uh, and at, at the House of Representatives, um, I know him as well. Um, although I'm, for some reason I'm blanking on this name right now, Ro Khanna. So Ro Khanna knows me because I've been, um, I helped campaign for him, so he knows me at the House of Representatives. I don't know my senator, state, uh, my U.S. senator personally. They don't know me yet. Um, I haven't had an opportunity. And uh, and uh, Kamala and Biden, are, I don't know them either personally, although some of my friends know them personally. So, um, yeah. Actually, I have a friend who's the current, uh, well, I, I think he remembers me. We, uh, he, he was my freshman dorm, um, the current uh, head of the State Department. So, um, yeah. Get to know your elected and your officials. Um, let's see, other comments. April's, April does UI design, psychology principles, yeah, are great. Okay, other questions? Have I missed anything in the chat? Or raise your hand here. We've got a few more minutes left before we hit nine o'clock. Yes, Jordan. Um, do you happen to know off the top of your head? And if not, I'll just look it up later. Um, do you happen to know which municipalities in the region you can, like, if you have a video or a picture of some of someone blocking a bike lane, 
um, or something like that, like municipality where you can submit that as as evidence for them, like either for law enforcement action or or what you were talking about early, like a, a polite uh, a polite message from law enforcement telling you that that's not something you can do. Uh, so publicizing it on social media just helps remind other drivers who may not necessarily block the bike lane that other people are blocking the bike lane, maybe shame those blockers. Um, you can, with 311 um, kind of services, report those issues. Um, I typically, when I run into that, I, I'll call the police on their non-emergency number or sometimes their emergency number because I'm really annoyed because it's maybe a really dangerous setup or it's causing an accident. I'll just call them and report it right away, even though they may complain, I'm calling the emergency number. I'll tell them, well, it's an emergency because they're creating an extremely dangerous situation. It's not just a nice to have. It's like, you know, you got to get this car moved. Um, so I'll, I'll typically call and I, I have video or I'll take pictures. And so I'll have the license um, of whoever it is or so I can report it to the police. So I'm calling the Sunnyvale non-emergency number quite a lot to report um, bike lane violators. And the San Jose one is harder to report. It's just more tedious. Um, there is, um, Pittsburgh is experimenting with a program which has an AI video camera that would actually automatically capture and report on their 311.org app bike lane violations of <laughs> cars parked. So you don't, it'll actually capture, it'll send them the map location, a picture, and the report. So that you can just say, yeah, do you want to report it? And say yes, and it'll actually handle the submission. I'd like to see that happen in San Jose and make it really faster. Um, that'd be really cool. And actually, it's just using your smartphone camera. So they've got they actually have a special mount for your smartphone so this camera can take record video you just need a big bigger battery attached to your smartphone so you can be running more often um so you can just push a button on your smartphone and like would submit it and it's like wow we may i'm hoping we have them talk at a bike summit that's coming up i i saw the most recently at the uh, national bike summit the american bicycles had in march it was pretty cool okay any more questions I can continue hanging out here longer than nine if you uh, have additional questions. Otherwise, you're free to leave. Sign up for- Thank uh, you. We'll see you Sunday. Uh, um, I think at some point you you said you might talk about some of the, um, um, either the, the newest bike legislation or some of the things that you're hoping to see in the future. Uh, I think you said at some point you wanted to talk about the Idaho stop. I don't know. Oh. I don't know if there's any other new or upcoming uh, things you wanted to talk about. Yeah. Um. So the Idaho stop, or it's called in California, the uh, California Safety Stop Bill, which the California bike um, or Cal bike is trying to get passed. It's been in front of um, Newsom twice now for him to sign, but he hasn't signed it either time. They're hoping that the third time will be the charm, um, and it is very straightforward is um, bicycles can treat stop signs as yields. And most of the routes the bicycles take tend to have a lot of stop signs on them, which gets really annoying for bicyclists because they're using a lot of energy to start and stop. Plus time in intersections is the most dangerous time for bicyclists because if car is not stopping at the stop sign. So the bicyclist wants to get through that area as quickly as possible. And to have to um, come up from a complete stop and be wobbly and not moving very fast is a dangerous time for a cyclist to get through an intersection. It's much safer, and it's easy. Bicycles aren't going very fast. They can um, basically slow up, be ready to stop completely, um, and look both ways to make sure no one's coming and that they can proceed on, and then roll through the stop sign. Um, cars kill lots of people, so having cars roll through stops is not a good idea. But having bicycles roll through stop signs isn't so bad because the car is not likely. It's not. They're not going to kill someone else in the car. They're not going to typically kill someone else on a bicycle, even or a pedestrian, because they're. They just won't be moving that fast going through an intersection. They have to be ready to stop. And so the way the um, the first version that they put up was the version that should be passed. The second version, they um, I think they may have pulled the bill before it actually got to uh, Gavin Newsom because it had too many complicated exceptions. It was too confusing to, you know, so how many different conditions do you have to meet before you can, you know, roll through a thing? Um, the show back to the original. They're also uh, concerned about the pushback from... I think it was highway, uh, some highway division because of um, and they were using teenagers or people who were younger didn't know how and and you you'll hear this by with some parents groups as well. Yeah. But <clears throat> that um, 
that, uh, that was a reason it didn't get pushed through the first time. The second time they pulled it because they were concerned that it was going the same direction. And yeah, there are a lot of conditions, a lot of a lot of them are related to the age. So the third time around, it's 18 plus. Um, but it's a simple yield at a stop sign, not. It, um, this, yeah, to this, you, you had to look out for a four way stop versus a two way stop. And it's like <laughs> it's hard to pay attention to. And actually, at a lot of two way stops, it's actually still safest not to come to a complete stop, because if you see an opening, you want to be able to get across that road as fast as possible. And it just takes a lot longer to accelerate from a complete stop and get yourself rebalanced. So um, just dealing consistently with stop signs would be best. And 18 year old, I'm fine with. Um, but they've got to make it simple and obvious so that everyone can do the same thing. And it will make things simpler. Uh, the first time I knew someone who uh, vetoed it or didn't sign it, um, he was cited some really bad information. It was not correct. Um, and all the police that are opposing it, they police like everything to be black and white because <laughs> they're black and white. They want to be very simple for them to enforce. They don't want judgment calls because <laughs> it makes it harder for them. But there's yeah, a lot of gray area where judgment calls are important. So, yeah. Um, any other any other things you personally um, want to see? So for legislation, um, uh, join CalBike and pay attention to their legislation page and the League of American Bicyclists at the national level. They have both excellent uh, resources for what legislation is happening. At our local level, we deal less with the laws as such and deal much more with projects. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we deal with laws, like sidewalk riding laws. We'd like to get those reformed so that it's clearly legal. Like Sunnyvale's um, current legal code for sidewalk riding, strangely enough, the way it's worded prohibits you from walking a bike on the, the sidewalk. And although it says that the bike riding on the sidewalk is prohibited, it gives you an exception. If it's dangerous for you on the road, then okay, then you can ride your bike on the sidewalk. But the way they have it worded is they say it's, it's prohibited from riding or operating a bicycle or motor scooter on a sidewalk. But if you're operating a bicycle, you're walking a bicycle with operating a bicycle too. So you just prevented them from walking their bicycle on the sidewalk. So they've, they've twisted themselves around. They need to make the, that particular uh, municipal ordinance clearer and simpler so people know how to follow it. And also mm -hmm. the speed of the sidewalk is really the issue. Um, yeah, it's safer to ride for, they, they actually make exception with kids. They can, they can ride on the sidewalk. But even a kid, if a kid's riding too fast on the sidewalk, which many of them are capable of, even at a young age, that's really unsafe for them. And so they should say, when you're on the sidewalk, be at pedestrian speeds and yield to pedestrians and leave it at that. Um, and they can make the their uh, ordinance much clearer and simpler. And that applies to actually a lot of the cities in their area. San Jose actually, interestingly enough, doesn't really prohibit uh, sidewalk riding at all, except in downtown, I think they've got some places that are specifically signed. They say, where it's signed, don't ride your bike. Otherwise it's fine. They don't go for the complicated language trying to cover all sidewalks and all conditions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, what city are you in? Um, I'm currently in San Jose. I've been in San Jose for about a year. Before that, I was eight years in Mountain View. Yeah, Mountain View actually is pretty good, and Palo Alto is pretty good. Um, although Palo Alto is maybe taking a dip, they're kind of going veering off. But um, the the staff that are in the city are really important. And right now, Mountain View has an excellent transportation manager who's very. Uh, she's gotten all of her staff to take this course. Part cycling part one and part two, which is if we get all the staff to take this, so they understand bicycling and understand mm -hmm. what is safe and legal, then they can do a much job, better job designing the facilities, knowing what to do. Um, I wish other cities would get everyone trained. San Jose actually is really good. They've got a lot of their staff also have taken this tra training. In fact, a lot of their staff are uh, league cycling instructors even. Um, and they've gotten specialists. They've got a big staff that actually specialize in bike and ped facilities that have actually done real training in that space. Versus a lot of the other cities, I haven't done um, very good uh, training in the bicycling space. They know car stuff well, but they just are not so good about the bicycling. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. San Jose Police Department is also not very good with the bicycling thing, except for the bike cops. They're actually pretty good, but the, most of the other cops don't understand bicycles either. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Are we good? Any other questions? Yeah, I, for I forget. I forget what the status of this is, um, of being able to go on a, on a, when you got a crosswalk signal, 
um, like if you've got the leading uh, pedestrian indicators. That will become law and legal for you to advance as a bicyclist on January 1st this next year. Okay. Um, although a lot of cyclists are doing it now anyways, because it is the easiest. I'm thing. doing it now, yeah. Yeah, me too. I'm doing it now. <laughs> it just gets you ahead of traffic so you don't have to deal with the car is, you know, doing strange things. So April, are you signed up for part two? I'm not sure. It's, it's this coming weekend, right? That's for the next part two. Yeah. Then there's some others coming. So you should sign up for one of them. And Jordan, are you going to take part two? Um, yeah, I think so. I'll, I, I don't know yet which which day, but yeah, I think I'll do it. Yeah. Tim, be are there any, any in August or September? Um, there are some. In, well, you have to look at the education page. I have to look at the issue okay. page. You remember. Um, and the, if the full schedule is there, whoops, um, let me look. August 19th. Okay. Yeah. When does the VTA funding run out? Is that just for this year or did, is it? Yeah. Um, so our contract ends beginning of October. But and we're in the process of getting it renewed and also making it more flexible. So we can offer more class, not have the, the classes tightly stipulated. So we have more flexibility in the classes we offer. So yeah, we have August 19th and September 17th for the part two also. Okay, cool. I'll probably we're, right, hmm? we're also trying to pair up part one and part two. So you have a part one just before a part two. So we okay. have a there. And the bike maintenance courses, actually, I didn't mention them to the other people, but they're um, pretty useful too. I, um, yeah, I did that a couple weeks ago. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Thanks very much for attending. And Thank you. forward to seeing you at the part two course. There, Tim. Are you, are you doing Hi. the part two this weekend? Yep. June 4th. I'll be there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good night.